know, it, it's it's just it's just a damn shame. I mean, it, you know, it really is. Um, you know, I, I, I appreciate you reaching out about it, but you have to also appreciate when you're involved in litigation, as ridiculous as the litigation is, you can't talk about these things. You know, you can't, I can't go into specifics about any case. Um, you know, I, you just can't. Um, as much as I'd like to, I just don't, you know. I've, I've done that with, you know, I don't know if you've ever been sued before. I hope you haven't. Um, but if you're in business, that's bound to happen, you know. You were almost sort of convinced or like pulled into the Clayton Morris uh, mentality trap, if you will. <laughs> you get off the phone with them and uh, you're just like, maybe he really didn't do anything. And then he goes to Portugal like three weeks later and you're like, wait, no, you just left. You just exactly. left. You went to Portugal, bro. <laughs> Clayton, you're, you're literally in Portugal, though. Like you, you see how that looks. You're you're actually in Portugal. So I mean, I I, I think <laughs> claiming it's bullshit when you're you've literally left America. I that doesn't really make sense, does it? I don't know how this is any of your business. To be honest with you, I really don't know how you've made my business your business. It's so convenient to focus on. It's so convenient to focus on the Fox guy. This but, is not. But, 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 but James, this is not this is not being an errand boy. Seven percent in our Indianapolis market were harmed. I don't uh, I don't agree with that math based on my sources. Reports have been circulating all over accusing former Fox News reporter Clayton Morris and his turnkey investment company, Morris Invest, of working with another company called Ocean Point Property Management and its owner Burt Whalen of orchestrating one of the largest scams in the history of the turnkey real estate space. Today we're going to talk about that along with the five things you can do to avoid becoming the victim of a turnkey real estate investment scam. Let's dive in. Hey, real estate investors, welcome to another episode of the Landlords from Hell show here on Holton Wise TV. I am your host, James Wise. Behind the scenes, we got my main man, Tommy, bringing all of the action to you. In today's show, folks, this is a fucking doozy. What we've got going on here on the Landlords from Hell show is some of the craziest stuff in the real estate investment space. There are a ton of reports and people and accounts out there that a company called Morris Invest, which is ran by a guy by the name of Clayton Morris. You may have heard of him because he was a Fox News reporter for many years. He left Fox News so he could run this turnkey real estate investment company. And uh, what we're focusing on is a lot of the properties that that company um, helped sell down in the Indianapolis, Indiana market. Uh, all of the properties down there in Indianapolis, Indiana were owned by a company called Ocean Point Property Management, which was owned by a fella by the name of Burt Whalen. There are a lot of accusations being levied that either Clayton Morris and his company Morris Invest defrauded investors. Some folks are saying that Burt Whalen and his company Ocean Point is the perpetrator of this alleged fraud. What we are going to do is we are going to get into some detail and talk to a lot of people who are actually involved in this. What I'm going to bring you guys in today's show, because what I'm not interested in doing I'm not interested in uh, rediscovering all the facts of this case. 
I have not personally invested with either Ocean Point or Morris Invest. Instead, what I want to do is really talk to some folks who were involved in person, just get everything out there, kind of aggregate all the data, and then finishing up the show, the most important thing. What really matters here, we are going to go over the five things that you can do to avoid becoming the victim of a turnkey real estate investment scam. What I want to do right now, I want to go directly to the footage. Let's take a look. I see all the stuff on, on bigger pockets and those, those ass clowns. No, I mean, the liberal press has had their, had their, that's why the conservative press hasn't touched it because they know it's a bullshit story. Um, but Clayton, you're, really you're literally in Portugal, though. I'll let you. Like, you, you see how that looks. You're, you're actually in Portugal. So, I mean, I, I, I think <laughs> claiming it's bullshit when you're, you've literally left America, I, that doesn't really make sense, does it? I don't know how this is any of your business, to be honest with you. I really don't know how you've made my business your business. Where I live with my family, where I choose to live, living in... I, how is this any of your business? You also don't know the statistics, which I'll share with you now, that only 7%, 7% in our Indianapolis market were harmed and uh, in this situation. I don't, uh, I don't agree with that math based on my sources. Well, because well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you right now. I'll, I'll, I'll give you, I'll you. give you what I got. I'll show you my hand. I'm telling you right now. Okay. We talked. You saw. So you told me at the highest level that that number is is accurate, and those numbers have been through with a fine tooth comb by authorities in a much higher position than you. You told me so, that you sold five hundred properties down there, correct? Right. You sold five hundred properties down there. Yeah? No? We didn't. Last time I talked to you, you said you sold 500 properties down there. We, we didn't sell a single property. Okay, you when I, you received uh, you received a commission of $6,000 for marketing 500 properties down there, yeah? That's what we talked about last time, me and you. I took notes. So you agree with me on that, right? Because that's I got that information from you. Are you now not agreeing with that information? I'm not, I'm not sure if that number is accurate. All right, because it no, was sure it was 500 is. last time when I talked to you. We spoke that it was 500 properties. And yeah. by the way, when we spoke, we spoke last and we spoke last time off the record. So that we spoke none of that when I spoke to you last time is off the record. 500 properties, six thousand dollars. That was I think it was two and million dollars. By the way, I have those text messages off the record sure so yeah any of that is off the record anyway. and we talked about how you made two million dollars and then we talked about how you know if you run the math on that based on the amount of money Whalen made versus the amount of money you made you made two million and ruined your entire reputation and you lot you left your cozy job on TV and he made roughly 29 and a half million that shit's in the that shit right there is pro Clayton it's in the video but what I'm trying to get to uh, right now what I'm trying to say right now uh, in regards to the 7% statistic you're giving me, if uh, we are in agreement that it was 500 properties, I have a property manager in Indianapolis. Uh, I'm sure you know him, Todd Burton. He is on the record telling me that uh, 100 investors reached out to him and he ended up working on 80 properties. Uh, 80. So. 80, I don't have a calculator in front of me, but... You realize that that has... No, and, and you realize, and I hope this is in your piece, because you realize Todd Burton's angle on this, right? I would imagine it's to... to I would, it's pretty obvious what his angle is, yes. Okay. Do you realize that he also had reached out to me to work with me and asked me to leave for that, like... He tried to, he tried to get our business haven't shared those emails with you, but he and his partner, I think it was Dave or Doug, I forget. Yeah, I know, I know uh, his partner. He out to want to work with them. Okay. And that, those properties are not all Morris Invest properties at all. Okay, well, 
and I'm not going. I'm not arguing. Have you talked to the other property managers? Well, hold on. House? I'm not I'm arguing. Josh Wetzel can tell you. Well, what I'm telling you right now, Clayton, is I'm not arguing that what you're telling me that all 80 of those are. I'm not arguing with you that what you're saying is incorrect, but I, I am saying that he is on the record, and he on the record claimed that 80 from Morris Invest specifically, he his company specifically worked on 80 properties from your supply chain. That is, he is on the record saying that, and that will be in the piece. I'm not arguing with you that you're, you're telling me right now not all of them are yours. I'm not accusing you of making that up. I'm just telling you he's on the record saying that 80 of them were, and that I will put that in the piece. We, as a property management company, ended up effectively taking nearly 80 of these properties through this Morris Ocean Point debacle and dealing with the fallout uh, associated with that and the owners. I've also talked to probably close to a hundred different owners uh, in addition to the ones that we manage for and helped a few of them get their properties either purchased back or just advise them uh, as to you know what I would suggest they do with the situation. Okay, so you've had over a hundred investors reach out to you and you have actually done work for 80 of them. Could you kind of walk me through, like, number one, how are these people finding you? Like 80 or, you know, 100, actually, over 100. That's a lot of people. So how are they all getting together and finding you guys? Uh, they primarily found this, um, it was about two and a half years before this thing really hit that we had an investor from California contact us, had two properties, had no idea what was going on with their properties. The tenants hadn't collected rent in over a year. Uh, we ended up dealing with, with those properties and those properties ended up being Ocean Point properties. Through that, I filed a, an attorney general's complaint. Uh, December of uh, 18, it came back um, and that's posted on Bigger Pockets. I started getting active in Bigger Pockets because of that and some of the chatter that was on there about the situation. And as more and more people came to uh, understand or contribute what was going on there, I became more involved and because of my participation, I became one of the primary people that, that people reached out to. Okay, so we had a little bit of investors coming to you, then you started doing this work, so then you went to the public, you went to the forums, you posted that attorney general complaint that you filed Correct. on bigger pockets. Uh, everyone, if you click the show notes below, uh, we are going to provide you with a link to Todd's attorney general complaint. If you'd like to go over and read it all, that's going to be in those show notes below. So now you're online, you've got the complaint, and now investors are just swarming to you, I assume. It's kind of like an avalanche. Yes, and, and I would like to also clarify that not only is that the complaint, it was the, it was the response from the attorney general's office to the complaint where they actually revoked uh, Burt Whalen's real estate license. Holton Wise has a worldwide audience of real estate investors. If you are a lender, home inspector, or anyone else with a real estate related business who would like to increase your sales and exposure with an ad in one of our videos, go to HoltonWise.com today. Burt Whalen is the, the primary or the owner of Ocean Point Investments the company that was working here locally with Morris and Best to source the properties and supposedly we have them do property management place tenants, but he doesn't have a license currently. So in fact, it was interesting because I was communicating through their Facebook page and asked if they had a real estate license at that point in time. And I got a response from them saying, no, we don't have a real estate license. We're a professional management company, but in the state of Indiana, you're required to have an Indiana licensed real estate broker to manage for third party companies. Okay. Okay. So guys, we have, you know, Burt Whalen running Ocean Point. He's running the on the ground infrastructure in Indy for Morris Invest. And Todd, at this point, you know, you're public with all this information. Investors are swarming to you. Can you walk me through like what a typical investor situation is like when they call you up like, hey, Todd, what's up? I bought these properties from Morris Invest. I need help. Where are they? 
like what do they need help with what is happening yeah um most of them i kind of were, were initially dumbfounded i think all of them felt like they were alone in the situation and because of the way things transpired in a, in a email that went out that was carbon copied instead of carbon instead of line carbon copied uh through the ocean point and their um, ahs and urban construction of their other uh intuitions uh Everybody was copied on that, and I think everybody found out that, hey, you know, I'm not alone. This is a bigger deal. It's not a one-off situation. So people would contact me, and they'd say, look, I don't know what to do. I'm in this situation. I, I get no communications. I see that you have a lot of experience in this area. You do property management. First and foremost, their question was, can you help me manage my property? Um, at which point, we would, we would tell them, look, we have to – Take a look at the situation. Here's what we found so far. Typically, these are highly distressed properties that have nothing done to them. Uh, any rehabs paid for typically weren't done or, or very little of which was done. So we went and what we would do is we would evaluate each property or the properties for the owners on a case-by-case -case basis and then try and give them a some instruction on what we're seeing and what their options were. And in the majority of cases, their best option was effectively just to cut their losses and move on. All right. So you, you say that, you know, cause right, there's, there's turnkey real estate, uh, which is what's being pitched. But then of course, you know, a lot of money can be made in real estate. When you buy an asset that's totally distressed, you put the money into it yourself, yes. you know, the Burr Correct. method, so to speak. Uh, so when you say that a lot of these properties were not renovated or very little of the renovation was done, was that sold to these investors uh, with them knowing full well they were buying a distressed asset or were they told that the asset was already renovated or were they buying a distressed asset and paying for a renovation up front, but then nobody was renovating it? What exactly went yeah, from, from what I, Yeah, from what I was seeing, if, if you look at the Morris Invest videos, he was selling complete, renovated, turnkey properties, or at least that's what he was presenting. But then what they were selling was properties that were not renovated, supposedly promising or building the renovation cost into the purchase price. But from what I've seen, there was no actual contractual obligation or, or anything in writing, no quotes, no bids, no anything to associate with those rehabs that were being uh, purchased or along with the property. Uh, so while they thought they were buying a rehab property, what they were really getting was a property that wasn't rehab with a property uh, and a promise to do a rehab, but no contractual obligation or anything associated with that at that point. And, uh, and that's why I think where they really got the wolf on their eyes. Now, Todd, I don't, you know, I'm in Cleveland. It's a very similar market to where you guys are down there, uh, but I don't know everything about your market. I don't know the exact prices. Can you like, tell, like a typical single family home, like a three bed, one bath, probably like 1200 square foot, I would assume like a, you know, C-class asset. What is that going to rent for? How much is it going to be worth when it's renovated? And like, how much are they worth when they're totally beat to shit? Yeah, um, those, what I would call a, a C-class property based like on what you're describing is probably going to be anywhere from about uh, 70 to $90,000 in a decent C-class, lower B-class. Um, usually, you know, if, it, if it's highly distressed, you know, you might put $20,000 into it. Uh, but what I was seeing here on the ground was that these properties were being advertised as C-class, but they were really typically what I would call a D-class property. Valuations after rehab might be fifty to $60,000. And that's the primary reason why we were advising the majority of people just to sell their properties because regardless of what they did to them, they were still going to be in these D-class neighborhoods. and, and would never really be a high quality asset for them. Okay. So it's kind of like twofold. So they were being told that they were buying an asset that should have a renovated market value of 70 to 90,000. In fact, they were one asset class lower, which is a renovated value of 50 to 60,000. And they were paying, I assume 50 to 60,000. What are 
distressed assets in that D class neighborhood, like really going for on the ground? Like, can you buy those for like 50, yeah. 20 K? Yeah. I, I've seen quite a few of the, uh, the uh, sales disclosures and the tax reports and things like that from, and parcel cards from the city. And most of these properties were being purchased for anywhere from about six to $20,000. It was pretty typical of what uh, Ocean Point would purchase them for. Okay, six to 20K. Now, obviously, Ocean Point is a management company. It's a large management company. Uh, do they have like an extreme inline uh, to get these properties? Or is that essentially like what beat, beat to hell houses are selling for in those neighborhoods on the open market out there? Uh, that's what they're selling for on the open market. But the majority of the homes, at least the uh, vast majority that I've seen, came through the property tax sale. Here okay. in Indianapolis, meaning that they were so distressed that the people who owned them didn't even want to pay the property taxes on them. That's how, how bad they were. Okay, so these guys are picking these up, 6 to 20K, uh, and they're telling investors, hey, we need to do a renovation or it's already renovated, one or the other, but then they're really still just getting the distressed asset. They're not putting it on paper in contract. So it's like me on the phone, yeah, Todd, I got this house, it's rent ready, it's good to go, and then I sell it to you. You don't do an inspection. I don't disclose any of the issues. And then post-close, you come to the realization that your house wasn't actually rent ready. That's what's happening? Correct. And then in a lot of cases, a lot of the investors had been collecting rents on properties that were either not rented or were under-rented. Leases for $400 where the owners were collecting $600 a month or there was nobody in them, which to me was, looks like an inducement to try and make people believe their asset is performing and to buy more of these properties. <clears throat> wow. So you're telling me that you have personally dealt with investors who purchased an asset, were told it was rented, and were actually receiving their monthly rental checks from the Ocean Point Morris Invest companies but in fact, the home was never renovated and there never was a tenant in place. That's what you're saying? Absolutely. So yes, 100%. So essentially, uh, that, you know, by all means appears to be a Ponzi scheme because if the money isn't coming from the rent, the only logical place that that money could possibly be coming from would be new investors purchasing new properties for this inflated price point uh, of basically 70 to 90 K for an unrenovated property in a lower asset class, which really has a value of roughly 20 K. That's what you're that's correct. Holy yes, sir. moly. That is rough. So when an investor, how, how did they find out that the rents were fake? Was that when they turned things over to you or like, how did like they come to the, like if they're getting paid, how did the ball drop and they figured out that they're, they were involved in essentially a Ponzi? Yeah. Some, some of that, uh, yeah. Some of that was their own personal experiences. Uh, some of that was also that if, if you read or speak to a lot of the investors, you'll see that I believe it was about April when every single one of them or the vast majority of them got some kind of notice saying that uh, their tenant had moved out and they were no longer able to collect rent and they had to do unit turns. But there were literally, you know, tens if not hundreds of these same letters sent at the exact same time. Wow. Um, so with these uh, 80 investors that ended up, uh, you know, trying to get you to help them pick up the pieces. What, what happened with a lot of them? Did you sell a lot of the properties? Were you able to take some of them over? Like what, what yes. happened? Were they able to do anything to mitigate their losses or what do we have going on right now? It was a combination of all those things. Some guys were able to put them back together and we've got a few of them that are cash flowing and working. Uh, some guys put money into them and then decided just to go ahead and sell them or put enough into them to clean them up to make make them presentable and at least accessible to other agents and other buyers. And then some guys just walked away. In one case, I know a guy who bought a house for 76 or 77,000. And when we sold it, he ended up uh, netting $17,000. He lost about $60,000. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. tough. Um, yeah. So like, well, let me tell you something else, James. Um, okay. In addition to all these distressed houses, 
they were building what they called new construction houses as well. And they were buying vacant city lots for $450 a piece, 450 to 500. And they were selling them for $68,500 with nothing more than a promise to build a home. No contract, nothing else other than a promise. They were closing and they were closing, getting paid $68,500. And there was no structure at all on the property. No contract to build it, nothing. And, and at this moment, as we record this interview right now, have any of those houses been built? Some of them have been built. I don't know the number of homes that have been built. I did have the subcontractor for the builder contacted me a couple of weeks ago and was telling me some things about the situation, about them not getting paid, about them stopping construction on on the properties. It's my understanding that the builder may be putting liens on those properties for monies he owed. I don't know that for sure, but I've heard that secondhand. Um, but I, I know personally of one lady that we manage for that has two of these lots and one of them is nothing more than still a vacant lot and the other has a trench built uh, for the foundation or done for the foundation. But uh, this has been over a year ago that she closed on these. And th these are vacant lots that she paid 68500 for with a real market, market value of $450. We are one year removed from her closing and there is no home and there is no contractor who is out there doing this work for her. Uh, from what I'm seeing out there right now, it appears that Clayton Morris and Morris Invest and Burt Whalen and Ocean Point are now blaming each other for miscommunications. And it just goes back to that, you know, things weren't in writing. It's a lot of he said, she said, and these guys are placing the blame back and forth. Uh, you are correct. They are blaming each other. There's been multiple occasions where the Morrises have said that they've gone to the attorney generals and they're trying to sue Burt Whalen and they're trying to go after him legally. I haven't seen anything. burt has been pretty closed mouth about this, which is probably in his best interest at this point. Uh, but yeah, that, that is uh, correct that they are effectively blaming each other and, and pointing the finger at each other at this point in time. Uh, one thing I would add to what you were saying about the inspections is, if you look at a lot of the communications and or talk to the owners like I have, they were all giving, being given a very hard sales pitch and being told things like inspections take too much time, we sell these, we move too quickly on them. And I would say to anybody out there considering investment real estate, if you hear anything like that, that's it. Stop at that point. If they don't allow inspections, you have no need to move forward. At the end of the day, if you get a feeling that it's not right, it probably isn't. And I think most of these people knew it wasn't, but I think they got caught in, in the hype and the pressure and the, the goodwill of, of somebody that they trusted because that person had been a trustworthy television personality. And I think that's the play that really got a lot of these people into it. When I had filed my attorney general's complaint, I got the response from them where they revoked his license and I posted that on the Bigger Pockets forum. And then within uh, like the next day, my phone rang at about 10 o'clock on a Friday night and I did not answer it. I got up the next morning and I had a message and uh, the, the message was from Burt Whalen. And we know this because we have a bondage phone system that captures phone numbers. And we were able to see that the phone was owned by Sandra Whalen, obviously uh, related to him. And uh, this was the message. Keep stopping lies, you stupid motherfucker. And I'm gonna be honest with you like you've never fucking seen before. You're a piece of shit loser. And I'm gonna fucking kill you. Wow. Uh, that, was, uh, that was quite the voicemail. Um, Special thanks to Todd for coming on and, and giving us all some insight into things he has physically seen on the ground. Todd has actually personally worked with investors who have been harmed down there in Indianapolis investing in these rental properties. Now, 
just listening to Todd's comments, it sounds like um, in Todd's, you know, from Todd's perspective, it sounds an awful lot like Todd believes that Clayton Morris and Burt Whalen and both of their companies, Morris Invest and Ocean Point, are equally involved in defrauding these investors. Um, but everybody doesn't feel that way. Uh, a guy, not surprisingly, who doesn't feel that way is Clayton Morris himself. This is not... I, I get that, but this is... I'm just trying to teach you journalism. So I went to journalism school. This is not how it works when you make news videos. A source tells you something, you fact check it, or else you don't include it. Like, you cannot just include some random comment from someone without and without verification of it. You, I mean, and maybe that's when you get back on camera and say, we cannot confirm that. That's what Todd is saying. That's what 60 Minutes would do. I mean, are you, you're saying you're, you're, you're making a documentary. Sure. Yeah. You know, I think it's a good thing you guys are doing this, honestly, just because, I mean, I know some other people have gotten hosed probably worse than I have, but okay. still, even at that, I mean, it's probably 20 grand that I've sunk into a property that I'm going to end up losing um, because of, you know, uh, being misled, I guess is the best thing, best way to put it. But yeah, I just want to really just want to do this just to make sure that other people are aware uh, before they, they jump on anything like this. You know? What I find interesting about some of your comments is um, <clears throat> even to this day as someone who's already gone through the process and in your own words, it was not a positive experience for you. Uh, you're still kind of hoping that maybe not everything was his fault or believing a little bit of, you know, what he's saying that not everything was his fault. The, the big crux of Clayton's argument uh, with a lot of the class action lawsuit issues that you had mentioned is that down in Indianapolis, Clayton had put a lot of trust into a gentleman by the name of Burt Whalen, who ran a company called ocean point. Mm -hmm. And uh, Clayton's whole defense is that, uh, he wasn't involved with a lot of the issues that folks had. And there's allegations of a Ponzi scheme and rents not being col uh, collected, um, renovations not being performed, things of that nature. Um, and Clayton has never denied that those things have happened, but his, his big defense has been, I didn't have anything to do with it. I was also duped by this guy, Burt Whalen and his company, Ocean Point. What I find really interesting about your story, Brent, is you didn't buy a property from Morris Invest in the Indianapolis market. Your property's in the Detroit market, which had nothing to do with Burt Whalen or his company, Ocean Point, but yet you've had some negative experiences. I only invested in one property with Morris Invest. Um, thankfully, I wanted to make sure I did my due diligence before going further. Um, and I put uh, cash, uh, 46,900 bucks into that first property upon initial acquisition. Were you originally planning on uh, buying more than one rental property and something gave you pause or was your intention to just buy one to see how it went? No, my original intention was to buy more, but I wanted to play this out and just see how it went. How much money are you going to lose on this investment with Morris Invest? Well, what it's looking like I'm going to lose once I sell, you know, hopefully here in the next month, is that uh, I'm going to lose about eight grand on um, the price differential from acquisition to sales price. Uh, I'm losing money is actually depreciated in value. And also with all the repairs that have been in, I'm about 12 grand in the hole. So all in, you know, in the cash flow over the course of holding this too has not been positive. It's been slightly negative. So I think I'm just right at $22,000 in the hole with this uh, beginning to end with this investment. But even from the very beginning, there were some red flags, some caution flags that kind of made me step back a little bit. So I let it play out longer, even though they were sending more deals my way continually, just to see how that first property was gonna really pan out in the long run. And thankfully I did because uh, I would have lost a lot more money if I would have kept investing. How, what red flags did you see that gave you pause? Well, I mean, the, the first big red flag that gave me pause was I didn't receive a, an initial rental check for probably two to three months after buying the property and there was supposed to already be a tenant in place. And then when I started doing some digging, I found other uh, things that I've been misled on throughout the acquisition process that uh, then uh, allowed me to take a further step back and evaluate, you know, all the other uh, issues that were in play. What other things were those? Well, what happened was when I went through the first uh, initial steps of vetting properties and looking at properties that they had, 
you get the, the kind of pro forma sheet that they send you. Uh, the one particular property that really interested me was a property in Detroit and it was advertised at 800 bucks a month in rental income. And then it was a purchase price of 46,900. I thought the price to rent ratios looked pretty good. Uh, later on down the line, I found out that uh, the rental income that had been received on that property was only 700 bucks a month and not 800. And upon talking to the property manager, they informed me that Morris Invest told them to keep collecting 700 and see if they could uh, increase that to 800 over the course of the year. And so they just went ahead and advertised it at 800 as opposed to 700 they, they had been receiving. So you were given notice from them that the official marketing stance from Morris Invest was to advertise the property at a higher rate than it was actually receiving? That is correct. Yep. They told the management company to continue to collect 700, even though they had advertised it at 800. And they told them if you can over the course of the next year, see if you can increase that to 800. So it was a complete fabrication up front on the performance sheet. And you did not find out that the rent was lower until after you had closed on the property? That's correct. It was probably maybe three to four months in after closing the property that I found this out. I started doing due diligence with the property manager asking a lot of questions. And I also found out that the tenant was not an employee where they said she was an employee. They said she was an employee of Google. Turns out she was unemployed and living with her mother from time to time. The mother was living in the house with her. So there was just a, the situation wasn't what it was portrayed to be. Now, when you say they said she was a, an employee of Google, who specifically is they? Is that Morris? Yeah, when I'm, when I'm mentioning, when I'm saying that, whenever I go through the process of, and I was working with an investment counselor with Morris Invest, so it wasn't Clayton Morris himself. It was a, a guy named James who's on their team. Um, he was sending me details of the properties as I was vetting them. And so this particular property was advertised at 800 bucks a month, market value of 46,900, and the tenant was a Google employee in Ann Arbor, Michigan. This was in the Detroit market. And so the, the, the fact that she was a Google employee was false, and the fact that the rent being collected was 800 bucks a month was false. I presume after you found out that the rent was actually $100 a month less than Morris Invest Company had advertised to you, and you also found out that they had advertised to you she had a job working for you know a very prominent company, Google. Uh, I, I presume you are a obviously upset, and b you probably reached out to Morris Invest uh, to ask him to rectify the situation. What happened when you reached out to him? Yeah, that was correct. After I found out that I was being misled, I reached out, sent a letter to the the gentleman I was working with, their investment counselor, and I said, you know what, uh, this hasn't been working out. I've, I've found these details and this information that has proven to be false from what you presented to me. It's like, can you guys rectify the situation? I'd like to just get this property off my hands. You know, if you can sell it to someone else or you can buy it back, whatever you have to do. Um, I, once I sent that email, within probably two hours time, I got a call from Clayton. And he was Clayton asking himself? Himself. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. He was asking me, you know, what was going on. And he wasn't aware that there was an issue with the property. And he was going to try to correct the situation. Um, and so we got off the phone. He was... He said he was going to do some digging and, and look into it. And I guess he did. Um, they told me that he was going to send me a check to make up for the past rent payments that I hadn't been receiving. So I did receive a check. And this was, I closed in August of 2017. This was in February of 2018 that I received just out of the blue a $4,000 check in the mail. I think to try to make amends, you know, but we still were dealing with the problem tenant. I was trying to go through the eviction process and, and there was no, I guess on their end, I don't think there was any kind of attitude towards like, okay, we'll try to buy this property back or anything like that. This was just a bandaid, I think, to throw at the problem. To me, it felt like it was just, okay, we get it. We messed up. Um, let's see if we can make things right. And here's the money to do so. And, and it just wasn't nearly enough to cover anything. And, and I was still dealing with a lot of headaches that I, I wasn't expecting to be dealing with. And it was just an ongoing issue even from there. Where are you at with the investment today? Well, where I'm at today with the investment is that I'm still holding it, but I do have it on the market. It looks like it's getting ready to sell to someone else. Now, um, once I got the problem tenant out in 2018, which the eviction process drug on forever, 
they would make a payment, you know, and, and kind of just hold us over for a little bit and make another payment two months later. Um, but we finally got them out after about six or seven months. What I, what I decided to do then, since the management company wasn't really that bad, they were fairly responsive. They were trying to help me out in the situation. We just put, I decided to put some money into it to fix it up a little bit, you know, make it look good, advertise it, see if we can get a, a really good quality tenant in place. So I spent at that point in time, probably about eight grand in just fixing up the bathroom and, you know, painting the walls, redoing the carpet, uh, some, some roofing issues needed to be repaired. And then we finally got a good tenant in place in August of that year um, and just tried to stabilize the property. So we, we found someone uh, in that can, that was paying and they've been paying ever since, but the property itself has continually given us issues. So now all in, I'm looking at about $12,500 I've put into the property just to keep it up to code, uh, to keep uh, maintenance uh, on the property in place so I can keep the tenant there. There was just a, I can go on the laundry list of items. There was a the AC unit was bad. Uh, a lot of the roofing was bad. There was holes in the wall. There was a lot of leaks that we weren't aware about. So the, the windows were bad, needed to be replaced. Um, none of this stuff was addressed upon acquisition acquisition, and didn't, wasn't discovered until the next year whenever I had the problem tenant out and I started really doing some assessments to see what kind of condition the, the property was in. Now, now that deferred maintenance you, you spoke about that wasn't addressed at acquisition, right? The home, you purchased it. I don't remember the exact amount you said, but it was in the mid 40s somewhere. Um, so when, you know, you're buying an investment property, right, for a value that low, um, there is, you know, some deferred maintenance that one would expect. And not every property needs to be sold to someone um, in 100% perfect condition, right? You take the Detroit market where you're buying it. The properties are older, right? They're probably 80 years old uh, or more. So not every property is going to be perfect. But what should always happen during any sale, of course, is a complete and transparent um, offering, right? That you need to know what you're buying. There's nothing wrong with buying a fixer upper so long as you know that you're buying a fixer upper. Do you feel that Clayton Morris and his team were transparent with the condition of the property when you were buying it? No, I, I don't believe there was transparency there at all throughout that process because what I was told through the investment counselor was when I was to acquire this property and, and the pictures I got were, were, they weren't detailed. You didn't get to see a lot. I got to see it from Google maps view and I, I, I did some evaluation on the location. But what I was told was that once I closed on the property, there would be a rehab process of about two to four weeks to getting the property spruced up, you know, in good condition. It needed to, there needed to be some repairs, but I asked specifically for a sheet of the repairs that were to be made. And I didn't get that sheet. Um, and so as I was checking on the property, even af after acquisition, uh, they told me they were going to keep me updated on what was happening. I didn't get an email. I didn't get a phone call, you know, for two or three weeks. So I eventually reached out to them and said, Hey, what's happening? You know, I haven't seen, received a rent check. I haven't heard from anyone about what was going on with the um, repairs. And then they told me, they, I heard back that all that needed to be done was replacement of a water uh, heater in the building. And so I was under the assumption that there was going to be a, a pretty thorough, you know, uh, renovation done to the home to really spruce it up. But instead, all I got was the water heater. And again, I should have done my due diligence to really dig into this process beforehand. But I put a lot of faith and trust into the system. And that was on my own fault. And I'm something I kicked myself for. But it was told to me that there would be a two to four week renovation process that will should. Uh, and that was going to be a part of the acquisition price. That, that should increase the equity into the property, um, neither of which has really happened. Now, uh, obviously, you know, uh, I'm in the real estate business. We sell properties and we have construction and all of that stuff as well. It's very common uh, in the real estate industry, especially the rental property industry, uh, for people to, to renovate properties. But what is almost completely unheard of um, except for the, the stories we're hearing about the Morris Invest Company and all of the investors, it is selling a property, telling investors that they're going to need to do a renovation, collecting that money as part of the purchase price, and then not even including a line-by-line -line scope of work in regards to what needs to be done. That is just not not normal in our industry. Do you feel like 
Clayton Morris and his company specifically targeted investors who may not know that and perhaps had their guards down? Like, did you know at that time that it was not an industry norm to agree to purchase a property up front that's going to have a generalized renovation but never actually be given that list? Like, did you know any of that at this time? I don't think I knew at that time that that was the norm to not receive the list of renovations to be done. And quite frankly, at that point in time, I feel like I was a bit naive just because I had some blind faith and trust into the system. I mean, they're pretty good at getting you hyped up and these properties are going to perform for you. You know, we're going to put some work into it. You're going to build some equity. You know, by the time, you know, the repairs are done, the home value is going to be higher than what it was whenever you purchased it. You know, these are all the, the things that you're kind of told. And so I put some trust into the system, which I'm kicking myself for, obviously. But yeah, it, it could be, I think, that they're targeting people who maybe just buy into the enthusiasm and into the sales pitch there. Uh, because in hindsight, yes, I wish I would have been firm on the fact that I need to see the detail of what's going into that, you know, uh, into the repairs of the property. But I didn't. And I think there's probably a lot of other people who were in the same boat as me. You've referenced several times that you were hyped into the system. Now that hyping is, a, do you think a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, you've probably seen Clayton on TV, you know, on Fox news for, uh, you know, close to 20 years? <laughs> Maybe so. I mean, it wasn't that I really watched Fox news. It was more so that I had heard him on an interview with bigger pockets uh, maybe eight months prior to reaching out to Morris Invest. And it just seemed like he was a genuine guy. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, maybe he is, maybe this isn't, you know, all entirely his fault. But at the same time, I think you have to be aware of what your business is doing. Um, and I did uh, have kind of blind trust into in the, to the system, maybe because I had heard him before. I was like, there's some legitimacy with that name because he's been on TV. You know, he's been on this... Uh, you know, uh, what I, I consider a respected podcast in bigger pockets. Um, so I didn't, at least I didn't think that I was going to be misled. And it could be probably because I have just heard him numerous times before on different venues. If, if you had the opportunity to speak to Clayton right now today, what would you say to him? Well, I, I, I would hope that he's straightened out some of the missteps that he's done. Um, and probably done to many investors. And, and by what I'm seeing, I know there's a class action lawsuit against him, all that stuff. So I'm not the only one who I feel like has probably been wronged in this manner. But if he needs to try to find a way to, I think, make amends with not just the investors, but everyone else he's misleading, maybe on his podcast. And also, I mean, it's, I'm a financial planner. In our world, we have to give disclosures continually about, you know, um, what to expect and what not to expect with what you're hearing, what information we're giving um, to blindly just be able to give information and facts and figures to people without portraying also the risks involved, I think uh, shows a little bit of a lack of character. So hopefully he's, he can clear that up on his end. So given that he has, he's in the middle of all these, these legal situations and um, he's now chosen to leave the United States of America. Do you think that he'll ever actually make amends to yourself and a lot of the other investors who've been harmed working with this company? I highly doubt it. I mean, that, that's, that's something that I'm sure it's just a, you know, it, it's a pipe dream, but you know, I hope at least, you know, he can, he can stop, you know, marketing what he's marketing through his podcast. I know he has a pretty good following with that podcast, unfortunately. Um, but if you know you're in hot water, you know, just stop and maybe you apologize. You know, that's the least you can do. But um, you know, stop, stop sending this message out there and stop at least trying to send people to your company because it's not working, obviously. You know, you have these legal situations that have popped up. So maybe the, the best way he can make amends is just by stopping, you know, what he's doing. Stop the marketing, apologize, you know, try to at least correct, course correct uh, what you're doing right now. Even though I don't think there's, for us and people who have gotten, you know, are, are on the raw end of these deals, uh, there's probably no hope for uh, financially getting amends, but it would at least make me somewhat happy to hear him at least stop, apologize, and just admit, you know, everything that's happened. And, and, and it is, you know, uh, even though he says it's, it's so-and-so and so-and-so else, Ocean Point, 
you know, it falls on your shoulders whenever this is your client base that has to deal with those repercussions. Who, who on the pro side is going to be in the video for me? Uh, well, if you're smart, uh, Clayton Morris, probably you. As far as like other people out there, there ain't really anybody else out there that's like singing your praises. If you have somebody that you think would be smart to talk to that would help you, I'd be interested in calling them. You gave me two phone numbers before. I called them both multiple times, and they didn't get back to me. So as of right now, it don't look like there's a lot of people out there singing your praises. But, you know. Well, those people have nothing to do with me. These were just people that were also harmed by birth. Your side of the story is you didn't harm anyone. You were also a victim. There's a goddamn judgment. There's a fucking lawsuit. And a goddamn judgment in the courts. It's public. It's been all over the Indian press. The the, the, the lawyer for... The lawyer for the, the, the plaintiffs that went after Bird won. They're all over. You can reach out to him. He'd be more than happy to talk to you. But they, you won't because you want to keep it focused on the anti like. I did. I didn't away. say that. I didn't say that one way or the other. I didn't say that one way or the other. You're putting words in my mouth. Again, I'm not. I'm not here to argue with you, man. Like you're putting words in my mouth at this point. Like there's a lot of lawsuits out there. There's like 25 of them. When, when when you do it, it just gets spun like you're spinning this. I mean, it per, you know, purposely ignoring and won't include like all these other people that were hurt by, by Ocean Point and Burr Whale and, and specifically focusing on me. I mean, it, it's definitely more than just an average guy that's selling homes, you know. It, he, he quit. He seemed like he had quite a passion for for re rental real estate. So enough to quit a Fox job. And that's when I decided I needed to talk to Mr. Morris himself. So what did I do? I left a comment on his YouTube channel and said, hey, Mr. Morris, hit me up via text on my personal cell so we can chat about what is going on here. And on March 30th, that is exactly what we did. Clayton Morris and I had a phone conversation and I took notes, no recordings or anything, just notes on the conversation that we had. And in that conversation, Mr. Morris was very open about what had happened. And the very very first thing that got me thinking, aha, I have a little bit of a better picture of what's going on here, was when Mr. Morris said, quote, he had a relationship he believed in, end quote, with a company that, quote, managed my personal properties as well, end quote. Regarding my conversation with Mr. Morris, very, very good conversation. We ended that call by realizing that 2019 will probably end up being the toughest year of Mr. Morris's life. But there was one quote that he left me with that I thought was especially powerful. Here it is. At the end of the call, he mentioned that when he gets on stage in front of 2,000 people, there are, quote, 2,000 opinions of me in the room. Not one of them is true. I can focus on the 1,000 people that love me or on that one troll, end quote. And ultimately, he suggested if we stay true to ourselves, we have nothing to worry about. Thanks for watching. Now, Kevin, you did uh, an interview with Clayton earlier this year, and, uh, you know, in... You go around, you make all these videos, uh, more or less you're exposing real estate related. I don't know if I want to use the term scams, but like anytime you see something in the real estate industry that doesn't sit well with you, you've made a lot of these exposure videos and they're very popular on YouTube. And, uh, you know, you go pretty hard at folks, right? Like, you know, it's pretty well documented out there that you've had a feud with Grant Cardone for what feels like oh, a couple years now. Uh, your video about Morris, though, I had felt that uh, you went a little light on him. Now, granted, your your video with him and your interview with him, that all happened before it came out that he fled the United States to Portugal. Do you still have that same feeling about him now that you did then? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, my video about Clayton Morris was one of those things where I, I decided – 
initially at least I thought it's over. He did his damage. It was, you know, terrible what happened and it's on. Let's now make a video about the learning lessons about how people could prevent getting scammed with turnkey real estate companies where these type of scams are significantly more prominent, especially since people are dealing with out of state investors and people in California are throwing money into places like Indianapolis. And then they're clueless that the properties that they're investing in are burned down or abandoned. And so I geared my video more towards the concept of really the turnkey industry a little bit more than Clayton Morris. But you're right, if I had made a, the video specifically about Clayton Morris and uh, you know the alleged crimes that he had committed and the money that he lost, I could have been a lot more aggressive. There's plenty of material. Now, <clears throat> I've talked to Clayton on the phone multiple times, mm -hmm. and you, you see this, this as a, a, like a more or less like a, a theme with a lot of the folks that uh, have claimed they've lost money investing with this platform. And I got that impression when I talked to him too. When you mm -hmm. talk to Clayton, the guy is like the most personable motherfucker I've ever talked to in my life. The guy is an amazing salesman and he just makes you feel so comfortable. Like when I talk to him, I'm, I'm talking to him, I'm telling him I'm making this video and, you know, there's going to be parts of the video that probably, you know, are going to come out very negative. And the guy's talking about, man, if you and I had met under different circumstances, we'd be getting a beer going to a Phillies game. And I'm like, man, I would love to get a beer with this guy. This is like the nicest guy ever. Did any of that like play a role in your thoughts on him after your original interview with him? Wow, you're making me realize something here that I may not have even thought of, but you're, you're right. It's totally possible looking back now that even myself who makes exposed videos could have been manipulated to decide, okay, well, rather than just going brutally hard on Clayton, let's just go hit the concept of turnkey real estate and you know how people can sort of prevent this possibly in the future. It's absolutely possible that his personality and how you know, we were able to connect on a level of talking about our children and even as simple, uh, you know, simple things like ring doorbells it, were things we were talking about. It's totally possible that that at least subconsciously manipulated me to gear my video towards the industry and not him. Yeah, I, I feel the same way because, <clears throat> you know, throughout the production of, of our documentary, our film here, uh, you know, after various phone calls with Clayton, I had to question some of the things other folks were saying. And I was like, wait, maybe we really need to, to look at Waylon deeper. Because, um, you know, Clayton has maintained throughout this entire experience uh, his, his defense. And he has maintained that he is every bit as much of a victim as those who are claiming to be victims. And that all of the blame should be pushed towards Burt Waylon. Now, when you did your video back then, right? You know, could have been a little bit of back then. Clayton hadn't left the country. A lot of the information we have today as you and I talk hasn't been out there. And it could have been a little bit of, you know, uh, a seduction, so to speak, after talking with Clayton. Because I'm a dude, everyone who's talked about having conversations with the guy, myself included, you feel that way after you talk to him. He's an amazing communicator. With what you have at your disposal now, all, all the knowledge you have right now available to you today, do you still agree that Clayton really wasn't involved in anything shysty uh, and most of the blame should be placed on Bert? Or what are your thoughts on that? To me, when you run a business, the buck stops with the business owner signing the contracts with the customers. And unfortunately, that's Clayton. If I'm going to run a company and my job is to subcontract essentially to property managers or uh, you know, actual general contractors, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. If there's a problem down the line, it's my problem because I represent to my customers that I'm going to do everything for them. And based on all of the research I've done, Unfortunately, that's what Clayton represented to his clients. His clients did not have the impression that they were working with other contractors and that he was essentially a referral service, sort of an intermediary. That's not the impression they had, so that's not the service they should have gotten. Now, to, to kind of piggyback off on that point, right? Mm -hmm. Because it, it, feels, it feels a little bit like, uh, you know, there was one defense and we've kind of shifted now that it's more convenient, right? Right. Because there's documentation out there 
uh, there, there's video evidence uh, where, yeah, the fact that he was acting simply as an intermediary wasn't necessarily pushed to the forefront, right? More or less, uh, he was acting as a real estate broker or a real estate agent collecting a commission. As a matter of fact, you know, through my conversations with him, uh, he broke down the commission structure to me that he was paid from Ocean Point because Clayton has never disputed that any of those properties uh, were owned by Ocean Point. Clayton at this point has claimed all those properties were owned by Ocean Point and he was simply acting as a, a, a middleman, right? A, a broker essentially, right? So the commission structure, he told me he sold roughly 500 of those down in Indy and he made, it was a varying scale. Eventually when he got really going, uh, he maxed out at 6,500. So the math, the rough napkin math that Clayton and I did was he made roughly two to 3 million in commissions because of this. I know the New York Times said he made, uh, I don't know, around five or 6 million, right? I'm a real estate broker. You're a real estate broker. I'm, a, I'm an Ohio real estate broker. You're a California real estate broker. Uh, Clayton has never held a real estate license in any of the 50 states. His wife held a license in New Jersey, uh, but none of these properties were in New Jersey. Do you think Clayton is in for a world of hurt when it comes to the Indiana Division of Real Estate also coming on top of him above everything else he's dealing with? That could just add insult to injury for him, honestly. I mean, it's clear to me that this is exactly the position that a real estate agent, a real estate broker fulfills that is taking you know, folks' money and, and sort of finding them deals and helping them transact that process and get the, I mean, this is textbook real estate sales. You know, I've got my own medium that, we, that is going to get the our side of the story out there in a big way, the correct way. I'm not interested in, in the same way that I would not hang out on bigger pockets owned by another company with people who threaten violence against their own terms of service. I, I have my own media. I don't work at bigger yeah. pockets. I I'm literally have no idea partner. what you're saying. My experience was actually horrible. Um, it started out very smooth as far as uh, uh, talking to his team, uh, you know, getting them to answer any questions I had. Uh, Basically, the money transaction was smooth. Uh, communication was was pretty good in in the beginning, uh, but from that point on, um, uh, the first house went fine. Uh, then I purchased two more properties from them, and then uh, three months later is when uh, everything went down. Can you go into detail on exactly what started to go downhill? Sure. So I I. Purchased my first property uh, sometime in, uh, I believe, November of 2016. Uh, I'm sorry, 2017, November. And it got rehabbed. Uh, they put a tenant in there. I started collecting rent. Uh, and uh, I purchased two more properties uh, in uh, March or February, sometime in February 20, uh, 2018. And then... Uh, I I received a strange email from uh, from his team uh, where, you know, 200, 300 people were copied on that email. And uh, that caught my attention. So I, I, I read the email. Uh, it says something along the lines of uh, uh, they're closing up shop. Uh, I can't remember the details of the email, but there were about, like I said, two, two to 300 people uh, uh, copied on that email. And some emails started flying back and forth between, uh, I later found out those were investors with uh, Clayton Morris. Um, you know, one person sent an email, a group email, uh, asking if anybody's received rent for the month of March. And uh, somebody else responded and said, well, I haven't received any rent. Uh, this was sometime in mid-March. They said, I haven't received any rent. They told me that the tenant defaulted. And then a, another email came and another email with the same exact uh, uh, reasons, uh, you know, tenant defaulted. And so uh, uh, at, at that point, uh, you know, the first red flag went on and uh, I hadn't received my March uh, rent either. And so, um, you know, when I called, I couldn't reach anybody. I couldn't reach their team. I couldn't reach the office. Uh, you know, the phone would ring, but nobody would answer. And so, uh, you know, by then it was, uh, I believe a few days later, 
I received an email saying that my tenant defaulted. Um, uh, and, and so at that point, you know, uh, like I said, the suspicion grew. Uh, then more emails came came in where investors, some of them that were suspicious, uh, flew out to uh, to Indiana, uh, found out that uh, there was no house. Uh, either there's no house or <laughs> the houses were um, in, um, they're not in a livable condition. They were a complete uh, disaster. There was no rehab done, uh, none of that stuff. And at that point, I decided uh, I decided to fly out to Indiana. Now, when my first house was rehabbed, I had hired a, a local agent there to do a walkthrough, uh, you know, take pictures, uh, FaceTime. And so I was okay with the first house. You know, it looked, it looked like it was in good condition. Uh, the second and third homes, now they were in the middle of a rehab, so I had no idea what condition they were in at that point. I wasn't even sure if, if there were any houses. Okay. So I decided, I decided to, to see for myself, uh, basically uh, booked a ticket, uh, fly, flew out to Indiana. And uh, the, the way Clayton Morris sold this idea was he had a whole team behind him. Now, he was the only face of the company. I only knew of Clayton Morris, and I pretty much uh, invested with him. Uh, his team, he, uh, what he claimed was he had a team of um, rehabbers. Then once they were finished rehabbing, they would just turn it over to a, uh, uh, a property management company, which was, at that point, you know, I had no idea it was a, a, a like an outsourced company. I thought it was part of the Clayton Morris team, and so. And why did uh, you why did you feel like it was part of the Clayton Morris team? What specifically made you feel that you would be dealing with Clayton Morris and his direct employees the entire time? All of his YouTube videos. That's exactly how he sold it. Okay. So it wasn't it wasn't a third party property management company that he just turned it over. It wasn't any of that. Everything that he said was my team, my team, my team. And okay. so, um, and at that point, like I said, so when the suspicion grew, I just decided to uh, basically look for another reputable uh, property management company. And, and and at that point, the emails. I mean, we were just going back. There was bunch of emails that were going back and forth between uh you know these investors and these and so are all the other investors uh in march of 2018 that were all cc'd on this large email chain correct okay correct so like i said some of them just saw land when they went out to indiana all they saw was land at the address that they were provided so there was no house but you know some of them had collected rent. So we suspected that, you know, the, what they did was just collect, you know, 40 or $50,000 uh, claiming that they were going to, you know, build it or rehab a house. And, you know, they paid everybody maybe a couple or three months worth of rent and said, Hey, your tenant defaulted. So I went out to Indiana, saw for myself, uh, they were not in neighborhoods that uh, Clay the Morris claimed they were in. Uh, these are D-class neighborhoods, you know, horrible, horrible uh, neighborhoods. And did you have a conversation with Clayton Morris and or his sales representatives at his company about the types of neighborhoods you were buying into? Like, was that a conversation? Did you discuss the types of neighborhoods prior to making your purchases? I did not, ha I did not ask those specific questions, but... Uh, he had a uh, a YouTube video where he shows uh, the type of neighborhoods that they, he buys in. Okay. And uh, I believe somebody, uh, somebody, had, I may have it, but somebody, some of the, those investors have that video. Um, and I've seen that video for myself. And it, he advertised it to be in B-class neighborhoods. Uh, he specifically says that these are hardworking, you know, nurses and, and post office workers that, that lived in these neighborhoods. Um, now, from the video, you can see the neighborhoods were, were really nice. Uh, you know, they were in A-class neighborhoods, but they were really decent neighborhoods. Um, he even did a walkthrough of the type of rehabs that his team performs. And uh, when you look at those rehabs, I mean, they were in excellent condition. At least in the video, that's, that's exactly how he advertised it.
So then when you actually physically showed up there in Indiana, what was the reality like versus what you were shown in that video? Um, so it was, it was day and night, uh, but I was still relieved to, I guess, relatively happy because the, uh, the houses were, um, you can tell they were rehabbed, but not completely. They were not completely done. So it wasn't just, uh, like a skeleton or, or like some, some people claimed it was just land. There were actual properties that some work has been done, but, uh, additional, I spent an additional, I believe, uh, twelve to thirteen thousand in, in rehab. Did you then contact Morris Invest about the fact that what you had purchased was different than what you thought you had purchased? How was that experience like for you when you tried to reach out to them about this? Uh, so when I tried to reach out, uh, it was at that point they have ar- they had already sent an email, the mass email, saying that they were closing up shop. And so uh, I couldn't reach anybody. Any of those numbers that were provided, um, there was just no answer. Um, somebody in that group emails uh, actually provided Clayton Morris's cell phone email saying that they were able to, to reach him. But, and I called that cell phone number, sent a text. I, I sent him an email, uh, and, uh, but there was, there was no response. So I figured at that point he was overwhelmed with phone calls from, you know, upset investors. And I figured that I was not going to get a a phone call. So I took matters into my own hands. I said, okay, I'll rehab these properties. I'll spend whatever extra amount and then try to, to recoup my money through, through rent. In totality, how much money do you estimate that you have lost in your experience working with Clayton Morris and Morris Invest? So I, first property was 45,000 and then the next two properties were just under 50,000 each. When it was all said and done, just to maintain, maintaining the, those properties, like I said, they were in D-class neighborhoods. So I had squatters uh, in one of them that ran up uh, $4,000 in water bill because you know, one of the pipes broke. Uh, uh, just just maintaining them was twenty thousand dollars over a course of a year, um, and uh, I finally just got tired of them and, and sold all of them for for a discount and ended up losing a total of uh, seventy three thousand dollars. If you could talk to Clayton Morris today about your seventy three thousand dollar loss, if he was sitting across the hall from you or across the aisle, what would you say to him? Man, uh, in all honesty, um, in those email exchanges, uh, there are people that have lost as much as $750,000. And this was a, a lady that pretty much invested all her retirement with Clayton Morris that I have actually personally talked to since then. Uh, there are people that have lost a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, I feel bad for them more than I feel bad for myself, mainly because. I'm young. I'm, I'm a lot younger than they are. And they don't have time to recoup their money. For me, it was a loss, $73,000 money that I worked hard for. But I still have time to, you know, to make it up and, and retire it with dignity. But not a lot of people can say that. And so I would ask him why, specifically for those people, more so, for, uh, more so than for myself. Where were you? when the news came out that Clayton Morris had left the United States of America and had fled with his family to Portugal? Uh, I was, I live in Austin. So I was in Austin at the time. Uh, I learned it through, uh, through the email chain. Uh, We still have that email chain chain to this date. We exchange, uh, you know, other information. Um, So I'm still in that email chain and I learned it from one of the people that sent the link on the news and, and I just read it. I read what it was there. your reaction when that news came about? Uh, I would, honestly, I wasn't surprised at all. Uh, because there were talks of him putting his, his, uh, his house up for sale in New Jersey. Somebody sent an email saying uh, his house was up for sale. And I think it was a $1.2 million house, some, something along those lines. And so I kind of expected him to, uh, 
to basically uh, disappear. When I saw that email, I knew that the next step was he was either going to run for, for Canada or somewhere out of, out of the country. So it wasn't a surprise. Do you believe that the investors involved in the multiple lawsuits against Clayton Morris are ever going to stand a chance at getting any type of repayment of monies lost now that him and his family are outside of America? I honestly don't. I, I, I was actually in one of those lawsuits and I, uh, I just dropped out because uh, one, I mean, the lawsuit takes forever to just to get information, to gather information. But two, um, I honestly don't think there's any money left. So, and that's, that's the reason I, I just dropped out of the lawsuit. Now, Clayton has maintained throughout this entire process, Clayton has never denied that real estate investors were harmed and he's never denied that a lot of money was lost. He has copped to both of those, but his defense has always been that he was a victim right along with you investors and that Burt Whalen and Burt Whalen's company Ocean Point defrauded Clayton Morris and Morris Invest right along with you folks. What is your opinion on his defense? Do you think that's a valid excuse? I don't think so because we, no, none of us learned of Burt Wallen until the, all this fiasco. I haven't heard of Burt Wallen. I haven't heard of any, anybody other than Clayton Morris. So the, the company Morris Invest, I literally only invested in Clayton Morris and, and basically the way he marketed his company. I don't know who Burt Wallen is. My relationship or my deal was not with Burt Wallen. It was with, with Clayton Morris specifically. So this is just more, uh, this is just Clayton playing victim. This is, I mean, you know, uh, no, de no defrauder is going to say, Hey, uh, yes, I defrauded all those people. The main reason I came to, I, I, I chose to come on is to make sure that another person does not fall victim. Clayton Morris is extremely convincing. I mean, he, he can sell you anything. And so, uh, just don't fall victim the way we all did. Like we, I have no reason to bash anybody's name that's trying to do business or trying to feed their families if they were doing it honestly. If, you know, I, I invest in the stock market. I make money and I lose money all the time. This is not, you know, this is not anything new. I understand the, uh, I understand the, uh, uh, the risks and investments. So this is not a bad deal that I made and, and that I'm, I'm, I'm angry about. You know, this is a clear scam that I'm trying to help other people prevent. Okay, well, I'm just telling you, like, you know, it's very easy to, like, hang out in bigger pockets and have all these guys shit talk me and make up lies about me. And from people who don't know me, don't know anything about me, and people who are, like, direct competitors who were trying to get my business. Why did you decide to speak with us and appear in this film? I'm hearing Clayton Morris constantly talking about, you know, on this news outlet and this news outlet, oh, I'm such a victim and, oh, most of my clients were happy and these are just a few malcontents. And so I, I think it's time for us to stop listening to the attorney who says, don't go to the media, it'll hurt our case. How is your life different today, having been through working with Clayton Morris and his company, Morris Invest? How has your life changed since you met him? Like, how do you live today versus how you thought you were going to be living out your retirement? Well, before him, I lived in a half a million dollar condo in Honolulu. I worked for a fabulous country a company, traveled all over the world. Uh, I was one of those people who couldn't tell you what the price of anything was because I didn't have to worry about the price of anything. If I wanted it, I bought it. Yeah, I lived four blocks off of uh, Ala Moana Beach Park in Honolulu. I, you know, if I wanted to, you know, to fly to Europe to be with friends, I could fly to Europe to be with friends. I spent probably six thousand dollars a month. Uh, yeah, about $6,000 a month without even thinking about it. Still having plenty of money to save. 
you know, so I'd have it ready to throw on a scan. Today, I live on less than $60 a day. And I live in Medellin, Colombia. Here I can live. My apartment here is uh, under $18 a day. I spend about $5 a day on food here. Uh, I own a small amount of things. They're in a storage unit in Honolulu now. That's my biggest expense all year long is that storage unit. So I no longer have a car. I sold all my jewelry. I sold my condo. Uh, I have less than $20,000 in the bank as an emergency fund. That's all that's left of that money that I saved back to keep me going while my uh, investments were maturing. <laughs> Uh, you know, one reason I don't want to be on video today is I haven't had a haircut in ages because I can't afford to have a haircut. I've budgeted for a haircut at the end of the month when I'm back in the U.S. So I, I, I went from, you know, not worrying about spending $30 on a single glass of wine to not being able to spend $30 on a haircut. <clears throat> wow. That that's just heart wrenching. Um Sam, that is uh that's a heart wrenching story. Our heart goes out to you. How did you end up investing with Clayton Morris and his program? Well, I was uh coming up on retirement. I was scared of the stock market in uh, 2016. And I knew I wanted to get into real estate. And I lived in Honolulu. The amount of money I had to invest at the most would have got me three of the properties. And in Honolulu? In Honolulu. Okay. I, I had never thought about, you know, being an absentee landowner. Okay. Uh, and then I was, um, I'm, I'm a, you probably guessed already, I'm a bit of a tech geek. Okay. So I, I watch just about all the podcasts on uh, tech TV. Okay. And, Clayton Morris, as you know, wrote an app that I used all the time called ReadFest. And he was on one of the shows and mentioned that he had this real estate podcast. I, I felt like I knew him. You know, it's not like I watched Fox TV or anything, but I knew him from, you know, technology podcast. And uh, his wife, Natalie, was a friend of a friend. And, you know, when he started talking about having his podcast, I was like, oh, I need to learn about stuff like that. Let me start listening. So I was actually at sea, so I had to wait till I came into the next port to download all their po past podcasts. So navigating a ship back and forth across the ocean every night on watch, I had one of my earphones in listening to his um, spiel. Got okay, totally and sucked in by it. So, so his shows are what propelled you to invest. And how much money uh, did you have available to you to invest with him? I had $730,000. That was my 401k, my IRA, my pension IRA, and I cashed out a full life, uh, a whole life, uh, life insurance policy. And I took a HELOC out on my house. And, and you invested all of that with Clayton Morris? No, I saved back about a, enough money for a year's living expenses because even though he made it sound like, you know, in a couple of months you'd be up and running, I figured it'd be more like a year before I could see any income coming off of rental houses. Okay, so of that uh, 700 something thousand you had, that was everything you had, your life savings. Do you know the approximate number you ended up investing with Clayton's program? About 690000 Okay. And, and how did that go? What happened to that 690000 when you invested it with Clayton's program? Did you make money or did you lose money? Oh, no. I think right now I'm running at about 52% loss. How did you spend that 690000 What did you buy? And then what was happening with your money that brings you to where you are today where you've lost more than half of it? Well, I bought 15 houses. Okay. Ranging from, let's see, I think the least expensive one I bought was about uh, 
39,000. The most expensive one I bought was 60,000. One was in Detroit, two were in Florida, and the rest were in Indianapolis. And everything seemed okay at first. I was planning on going up and visiting the houses as soon as I was able to uh, cut loose from selling my home in Honolulu and uh, start, I, I was planning on traveling uh, when I retired. Now I had to retire to get a hold of my money. And so I uh, didn't want to live in Honolulu anymore after my retirement. I was selling my place, decided you know, to start traveling. And uh, so I was gearing up to you know, go around the US and visit all my properties and see them. I wasn't expecting anything to be wrong. And while I was selling my place, I uh, fell sick with a cold. And as soon as that was over, I got the flu for three weeks. I was very, very ill. And I get this email from one of the other owners saying, are you having problems with uh, receiving your, uh, I think it was April rents? And I was. And then I... What had happened was she had gotten an email where all the owners and a lot of other people were copied in without it being blind copy. So she had this huge mailing list and she just did a broadcast email to all of us going, are you having these issues? These are the issues I'm having. And I was like, yes. You know, they just told me that uh, one of my tenants had stopped paying their rent and uh, you know, they were starting an eviction and, then we started bouncing things back and forth. Uh, you know, I found out it was all a scam. It's well, can, can totally we take good. a step back? Uh, can we just like paint a, <clears throat> a more detailed picture? So it's roughly April. You receive this email. Other people are carbon copied on it. So you mm -hmm. talked to a couple other folks that were also having trouble collecting rent. No, I wasn't the one that uh, got the email. The email was got by a woman named Amanda. Okay. And she just made a mailing list out of all those uh, copied in addresses. Okay. Assuming that, you know, they were uh, clients of Morris Invest. And we just, we started up a, a Google group. Okay. And started just talking about our experiences. What were some of the other people in that Google group experiencing that led you guys to believe that this could possibly be a scam? Well, see, I had no suspicion whatsoever because it was just a few days of, oh, we're sorry, we didn't get the April rents for this property. Uh, and I was very sick, too. So I wasn't, uh, you know, like digging into it, trying to find out what's going on. I had no suspicions. And it was when everybody started telling their stories, uh, you know, people saying, oh, I went to see my property. It's got squatters in it or some of my other properties, they say they're paying rent to Morris Invest. I've never received rent. So I hired people to go look at my houses. And that's when I absolutely was convinced it was a scam. What did they I mean, uncover when they looked at your houses? Oh, boy. Uh, they sent me photographs. And when they sent me photographs, they said, make sure you're sitting down and try to be very calm when you look at these. Uh, one house was missing half its back wall. They had been sending me photographs of their rehabs. And my new property manager sent me photographs that were just horrifying. Uh, they, they, they laid carpet over a hole in the floor so that they could take some pretty pictures of one property to send to me. These are uh, slum houses. You know, they're not the class C properties. They, they're class D properties. Now, uh, <clears throat> when you hired these, these individuals to, to confirm what your properties look like and they're sending you these photos, the home without a wall, the home where they had laid carpet over a hole in the floor, I, I would presume the first thing you did uh, is reach out to Clayton Morris and, and his company, Morris Invest, and ask them what's going on. What had happened when you did that? No reply. Now, this is the kicker. 
a couple of weeks after they refused to answer any of my emails, uh, they uh, contacted me and offered to sell me another house. How many times did you, that's crazy. How many times did you contact them? after? Because I would assume, right, if I'm you, I'm, I'm retired. I spent the majority of my life savings uh, with this man who I've seen on TV and who you said you started to feel like you knew him. Um, everything seems like it's going well. You find out from all these other people they're having problems. So you hire third parties to go corroborate their stories, and you find out that your homes that you thought had tenants in them and were paying you rent are, in your words, slums. One, in your words, was missing the back wall. One, they had placed carpet over a hole in the floor. I imagine you know that was probably very shocking and hurtful to you. How many times did you reach out to Clayton Morris and Morris Invest? I mean, you had to be frantic at this point, no? Well, actually, hearing so many other stories, I only did basic. You know, basically sending emails to every email address I had, text messages to every phone number I had, just basically saying, you know, you've ripped me off. What are you going to do about it? No answer. I'm actually a pretty pragmatic person. I knew I had lost everything. And that is the basis that I went off of, was you've lost everything. You've done something really stupid. Now, <clears throat> throughout this entire process, Clayton Morris has maintained that he was merely a middleman and he was merely connecting investors like you with property managers in these markets. And the big market where you had the majority of your loss was Indianapolis. And the main person that he was connecting investors with was Burt Whalen and his company, Ocean Point. I never heard of Burt Whalen until the uh, emails started going back and forth among the owners. Never heard of him. Clayton so Morris, if you listen to his podcast, makes it sound like Ocean Point is his company. Okay. So when you were actually going through the process to buy these properties, you thought you were buying them from Clayton Morris? Yes. And the first property they sold me, I actually bought directly from Clayton Morris. As in Clayton Morris had signed your purchase agreement? Yes. And basically, I questioned them when the next one was signed by someone called Natalie Basin or something like that. And they were like, oh, yeah, she's just the office manager here. You so know, they can't sign every one. So, so just to clarify what you're telling me now, the first property you bought, you have no idea who Burt Whalen is. Clayton Morris himself actually signed your purchase agreement. But the mm -hmm. second property you bought, another person named Natalie signed your purchase agreement. This confused you. You asked the Clayton Morris Invest team who she was, and they clarified to you who she was. Who'd they say? They said she was the office manager. Now, you know, 2020 hindsight, I realized that any time I was asking a question that could have legal issues, they phoned me. They did not answer an email on anything that could really come back at them. And of course, I interpreted this as them being very. Uh, helpful and personal and taking care of me. I, it wasn't until later I realized, oh, they were making sure no, nothing like that was in writing. But in these phone calls, mm -hmm. what were they doing? Were they trying to assure you? Like, it sounds like you had a little bit of doubts. Were they assuring you that, no, you're dealing directly with Clayton Morris's properties? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, uh, and you know, plus, you know, Natalie's sister, apparently worked for Ocean Point. Yeah, you know, it made it seem like it was just this family business. So, uh, you know, I assume that this uh, Natalie Basin or whatever her name was, was a uh, part of his family. Because it seemed like every time he turned around, a family member was involved in this. So it came across to me as a very you know, family-oriented thing. When was the first time that someone from Clayton Morris or his team, Morris Invest, or him himself, Clayton himself, when was the first time someone ever mentioned to you that your 
that they believed your problems were, in fact, with Burt Whalen. When was that ever brought to your attention? Or was it? Well, I, uh, after this all blew up, I got no personal contact from Morris at best, except for his uh, shield trying to get me to buy another house. Uh, everything basically was letters sent to the group telling us that, oh, no, 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 Burt Whalen, we don't have anything to do with them. Um, Clayton was conned. He found out Ocean Point was a fraud. He set up this new company. Switch all your properties to this new management company. And uh, so at first, yeah, I, I thought, yeah, hell, come on, poor man, he's been conned. So I did switch them over. And then I found out that uh, this new company was apparently the same company with a different name. And, but at this time, I was being bombarded with emails from all these other owners, people actually going to the offices of Ocean Point and pounding on the doors. You know, and finding out that Ocean Point in Jacksonville was a UPS drop. <laughs> and so I... Um, and of course, all the owners were like, oh, I found this uh, property manager. I'm getting all my stuff out from underneath these people and seeing what I can salvage. And I figured that was the best direction to go. So I got in touch with uh, one of the property managers there in Indianapolis and just basically figured I was cutting my losses. Like talking to you now, this is because I've given up on the lawsuit. I've, I've come to terms with the fact that I've lost all that investment. Why have you given up on the class action lawsuit? Does it have anything to do with the fact that Clayton had fled the United States to go to Portugal? Yeah. Yep. Yep. That has a lot to do with it. And the fact that, uh, you know, it seems like in the atmosphere of the U.S. judicial system right now, if you're a, you know, average white guy who rips off people with your tongue instead of with a gun, Nothing's going to happen to you, especially when you take off and move to <laughs> Portugal. So what was the tone like in your group, your group of other investors who you've, I would imagine, built somewhat of a support system with? What was the tone like when the information, when the articles came out that Clayton had left the United States? the general tone is that all of us are just like figures. I, I think we're beyond being shocked about anything anymore. I mean, my story is bad, but my story is not the worst. One guy, uh, the house burned before he bought it and he was never told it burned. Uh, one person bought uh one of Clayton's new build houses. Uh, when he went to see it, it had no doors and windows. They had simply put siding all around the house without putting doors and windows in. Wow. Uh, I mean, it got to the point where I wasn't even reading them anymore. It was just too much for me to handle. I mean, I had a really good income before I retired. And the only reason I retired when I did was because I figured I'd run out of good luck. I was in a dangerous job and I figured, you know, if I kept at it, I would end up dying in it. But I thought I had everything settled where I'd have a decent income in my retirement. Not you know, as good as when I was working full time, but, you know, suddenly, you know, I was sitting there thinking, I no longer can uh, take my time selling my condo. I can't afford this mortgage payment. You know, I've, I've got to take uh, whatever they offer me. And which is what I did. I accepted uh, quite a bit less for my condo in Honolulu than I would have. What do you think should happen to Clayton Morris? because of all of this. I still want to see him under the jail. And his wife too, because I would have never invested with him if 
she happened to have been uh, sitting next to him with the baby cooing. And you know, she, she gave him the respectability. If he had just been some guy, I, I wouldn't have invested. Do you think that Clayton Morris intended to defraud you and others, or do you think he was really duped by Burt Whalen? I think he was a fraud. I think he knew what he was doing. Because if you look at the stories he tells on himself, oh, you know, I made this bad investment, I did that bad investment. In retrospect, looking at those, you know, he was trying to get something over on somebody with those investments. He just ended up short with them. And no, I, I don't. I don't believe his story about being a victim. I think he should be brought back to the United States, stripped of everything he owned, and serve a good long jail sentence. I see you. I see you in bigger pockets blowing Todd Burton hanging out in bigger pockets and Jay Hendricks, like you're hanging out with these guys back patting each other on the back back and forth you know the train wreck that that has come from Morris um that we're hearing about anyway or alleged train wreck so I, I was thinking about that prior to our talk today is you know how did we protect the investor and how did they get you know goofed up with the Morris situation and it was pretty easy that you know, there was no lender involved, it was all cash, and there was no third party taking care of the rehab, making sure that the rehabs got done. And then allegedly, or based on, you know, on online commentary that you see, um, there was a lot of um, folks that never went, never looked, and just blindly trusted what they were being told, and a lot of what they were being told just simply wasn't true. So we were able to, um, bring a, a, a big amount of safety net to the to the out-of-state investor. At the end of the day, they got a rehabbed house. They got a refi done. Very few people paid cash, um, or they wouldn't come to us if they had cash. There was no way to do that. But, you know, where, where it happened with the Morris is there was no third party, like we were the lender, you know, protecting um, the rehab money and making sure the rehabs actually got done. And in those days, like I said, I would go out and vet the turnkey operator, make sure they had property management in place, make sure they had crews that could do the rehab, so on and so forth. I probably did over 2,000 of those loans. That's how I see that. And, and that, that's the thing, right? Like the key takeaway uh, that I got from, you know, what you're saying here is like you specifically, you went out, you vetted these people and, you know, you made sure the rehabs were actually getting done. Uh, because, you know, there's two sides of the story, obviously. Well, there's, you know, there's two sides and then there's the exact truth. I'm sure not, you know, it's a little bit deeper than all of that. But the main thing that a lot of the people uh, that are crying foul, right, they're saying that rehabs actually weren't getting done. And uh, there is a lot of evidence that that is true. Um, but I guess my question is, looking at the bigger picture, industry-wide, moving forward, like you went out and you vetted these turnkey people and you made sure that these rehabs were actually getting done in all of your years in this business. Uh, did you, when you were vetting these people, did you come across turnkey providers that uh, had huge red flags that you denied their business or you said, no, you're trying to run a scam. Like I'm sure you've run into this before in your long career. Yes. Oh yes, absolutely. And, and normally it wasn't, um, they were out and out, um, trying to run a scam, they were just not ready for prime time. So we'd get in two or three deals deep, the rehabs weren't getting done, we couldn't get the refi, and that vendor was turned off. You know, no longer did it. That's, that's the amazing part of what happened in Indianapolis is, you know, it went on for a couple of years and hundreds and hundreds of properties. If those folks have been using a lender, a hard money lender or any kind of lender, that would have, that whole situation would have never got out of control like that. And it's the same thing with, um, you know, West Coast uh, marketing companies, which, uh, you know, we know all the big, you know, turnkey marketing companies, they'll get going with a trusted market specialist or vendor. And all of a sudden, they're not quite ready for, you know, they have uh, blowback or, or bad deals, you'll see that online sometimes, and they'll, they'll just stop working with that vendor. But it never gets out of control. They may have to go in and do damage control on, you know, half a dozen or a dozen properties, but it's never, 
you know, 500 or a thousand, like, you know, we're, we're allegedly hearing about in Indianapolis. Do you find uh, that it to be credible that Clayton was simply an honest working uh, victim right along with the other victims here, or is that total nonsense? I think it's total nonsense because he went into other markets and he's selling the exact same high risk property. I, I think it's more a greed factor and or an ineptitude factor. He doesn't really know what he's doing. He doesn't realize, I mean, you saw his videos. Oh, D-class, C-class property, the renters are easier to manage than A-class. I mean, anybody in the rental business knows that that's just patently, op it's the opposite is true. <laughs> and, and, and so he's, I mean, I don't, I doubt Waylon came up and told him that and he just believed it. I mean, this is his own, his own marketing. I mean, it's just, Everything that he would talk about uh, was almost directionally opposite of what reality is in the field. The thing, James, is, um, you know, I wouldn't loan on properties that were the worst of the worst, right? Okay. So I go out and I check out the market. So the, the investor back east had me to rely on because I'm, at the end of the day, if they didn't pay me back, who's taking the risk? It's me. So sure. it, wasn't, it wasn't the investor, you know, I... I mean, it, they just stopped paying. I end up foreclosing on them. But at the end of the day, it was our, it was our, it's our capital at risk. So you have an alignment of interest. You have the buyer, you have the lender, and the lender is going to, and today we see that in the lending business, they, they vet, you know, the operators pretty hard um, to, uh, before they're going to loan money. And in your operation, so you're, you're loaning money on a short-term basis. Uh, so like, you know, those systems are in place because nobody gets paid. You don't get paid if the buyer themselves actually has a reasonable product that they can refinance out through that residential financing. So that's good to have those in place. Uh, through those people that you did cut off, you had stated that, uh, you know, they weren't trying to run scams necessarily, but, you know, they weren't ready for prime time. They weren't, you know, totally ready to get into this. So maybe they had good intentions, but like, were you seeing guys that, uh, you know, they just didn't have the infrastructure built up and, and you could foresee it getting out of control. And is there anyone specifically that you'd care to speak to that you did shut off very early who later on went to build up something a little bit bigger on their own that is similar to what we're seeing today with what happened in Indianapolis? Uh, not really. The, guy, the guys that I, I shut off back, you know, we're talking 10, 12, 15 years ago, I, I I don't even remember who they are, most of them. And it was so short lived. Um, I don't really know any of them that have gone on. Um, I do know of one that's all public record that I can speak to where I never got started with them. They, they came to visit me in Oregon and laid out their business model. And I just told them, you're, you know, this is, you're going to fail. And why, why business, were they going to fail? Because they were buying the cheapest property. The okay. cheapest property, just like Morris did, buying five ten thousand dollar houses. So we know those are those are the roughest, toughest neighborhoods, hardest to sustain um, rental income on. And then they were setting up um, their their background. The guys that were setting the program up, their background was financial advisors and annuity salesmen. So they were trying to bring the annuity business to the real estate space. And they were going, they were attacking their um, clients that were, you know, in wealth management situations with financial advisors and trying to bring a real estate product uh, that was like an annuity. So they would sell it as a, almost like a security. And, you know, we'll, we'll guarantee the rents for two years. We'll handle everything. We'll do it all. And you just have to put the money up. Well, if you know anything about which you do, uh, D class property, F class, D class, low C class, it's anything but um, sustainable um, cash flow. You know, some will go fine, but you can have three that, you know, you have turnover four times a year or three times a year. So their cash flow, um, they just ran out of cash based on having to guarantee rents for so long and maintenance. For, so they just did all these big guarantees. And then what happens, they started. Uh, Rob and Peter to pay Paul. Uh, they raised a lot of money for, um, you know, other types of situations that that money went to 
try to plug the hole of the people that they had promised to pay payments to. Uh, long story short, um, indictments and jail. And the, the, the mastermind of that was a guy named Chad Ducher, and his company was called Marquise um, Properties, and they were located out of Utah. And um, so, I mean, that one I followed, and I, I didn't, I wouldn't fund into what he, he was doing because I knew it wasn't viable. It wasn't sustainable. <clears throat> so he, this actually, it went from simil, civil to, to being criminal. I assume like what were the, the actual charges? Probably wire fraud, something of that nature? or it's, it's always wire fraud. And a lot of people don't understand what wire fraud is. Wire fraud is also the dissemination of false information. So if you have... Um, a turnkey operator saying we are going to do this and we're going to do that and we represent we're going to do this and it's all false that's that's wire fraud it doesn't have to be money it can be information as well so with that point then um because you know that's really a big you know cusp of everybody who's crying foul on the morris situation uh do you believe that uh this Morris situation, all the stuff that happened in Indianapolis, do you, in your expert opinion, do you think it's possible that we could eventually go down a wire fraud uh, path? Because a lot of uh, the marketing that was done by Morris Invest, um, it, to, to me, the message, because like right now, his biggest defense is, hey, I was duped by Burt Whalen and Ocean Point. I promoted properties, I showed you guys the properties, and then I passed you on to Ocean Point. But then we're seeing evidence that Morris actually signed purchase agreements himself. And, you know, he promoted his three-step process. So with all of that in mind, his defense right now seems to be counter, counteractive of uh, what his message was. Do, do you foresee uh, a chance of going down the wire fraud, uh, the wire fraud pathway here? Well, yeah, I, I mean, for sure. You can't have hundreds of people that have lost, you know, significant sums and some that have um, lost entire life savings or retirement accounts. I mean, they're, and a lot of it is, is they paid for rehab that never got done. I mean, that's just out now fraud. So whether Morris took the money in or Whalen took the money in, the problem is, is there, there wasn't a, a definition of roles um, it's not like a real estate broker, you know, make it clearly defining them as a, a commission and you have a seller and you, have, you know, he didn't, he didn't market himself as a, a broker or a, a middleman. He marketed himself as, oh, I bought one of those Morris houses. Everybody that got online is I bought a house from Morris. And you see, um, you know, evidence of that in the pleadings where, you know, it was an alter ego of Ocean Point. And um, so, yeah, I, I think if if they want to wrap everybody into that, it's it's you know it, it's highly likely that something like that could happen. Really depends on um, you know the the state regulators whether they want to you know put the time and effort in, into doing that. Um, you know, one way, and you know, we've talked about this, you know, you either, if you're going to sell property you don't own, you need to be licensed. So you either have a massive amount of, you know, real estate brokerage violations, <laughs> you know, taking fees. So you can't have it one way or the other. I mean, he was clearly out there selling real estate and I think it's been demonstrated he has no real estate license. So that, that is correct. I, I spoke to more uh, Clayton himself for a couple hours. Um, and uh, yes, he does not have a license in any of the 50 states. Right. Uh, his wife does have a license, but that was in New Jersey. So she was not, uh, you know, they weren't using her license and she wasn't acting as a person selling it um, to that point, specifically speaking. Right. Uh, so I, I, I talked to Clayton about this because Clayton, you know, he did bring up a, a couple of interesting points, uh, which will be, you know, people will be highlighted in other parts of this video. Um, but some of the points that Clayton brought up we're interesting, but one of the points that I wanted to keep hammering uh, to Clayton during our conversation and that he really appeared to have no uh, way to back himself out of that corner was the fact that, uh, okay, if you don't own this real estate, if it's actually Ocean's Point, Ocean Point's real estate, uh, you are acting as a real estate broker. I asked him if he was worried about getting in trouble with the Indianapolis Division of Real Estate. Um, at one point, 
because there are there are contracts out there that Clayton has actually signed as the seller. Clayton's story is that uh, at one point he negotiated with Ocean Point and Burt Whalen to actually become a part owner of Ocean Point, to be a part owner of that entity so he could do that. Uh, and at one point, Clayton was under the impression he was an owner of Ocean Point, uh, but that never got finalized, and then he aborted. So in this situation, it, it appears he's going to have to admit one or the other. He's going to have to admit that he brokered several million dollars worth of real estate without a license, which is very punishable, or mm -hmm. he's going to have to admit uh, to being an undisclosed agent and also admit to being the person that sold uh, these fraudulent houses. So he's well, going to have to admit to one of them. Yeah, he's he is an undisclosed principal. He's an undisclosed agent. I mean, there, there's all sorts of problems with his, his defense. And, and it'll go, you know, in a deposition, it would just go, were you lying then or are you lying now? I mean, there's he has no way out of that. You know, I, and I appreciate you you know, I know what your angle is, and you're trying to lift yourself up as like an authority on this, and I appreciate that. But, you know, if you're going to take the same tactic and strategy as the liberal press that they totally ignored for the sake of clickbait, when reporters would tell us that they specifically were not going to include other people that were harmed because they wanted to focus on the Fox guy just to drive traffic. And we've had conservative reporters reach out to us and just say how laughable it's been. And, you know, it, it's, it's, just, it's just a damn shame. I mean, you know, it really is. Um, you know, I, I, I appreciate you reaching out about it, but you have to also appreciate when you're involved in litigation, as ridiculous as the litigation is, you can't talk about these things. You know, you can't, I can't go into specific about any case um, you know, I, you just can't, um, as much as I'd like to, I just don't, you know, I've, I've done that with, you know, I don't know if you've ever been sued before. I hope you haven't. Um, but if you're in business, that's bound to happen, you know? I would imagine this is a rather difficult story to tell. Why come on and, and, and tell your story to the general public? Um, it is hard to tell. It's um, been very stressful and it's embarrassing. I mean, I'm an educated person and I took my time um, taking this step to, to do this and to have it turn out this way is humiliating. It's embarrassing. Uh, I came on the show so that other people hopefully um, will be able to see this video um, and be able to be forewarned. If I can help somebody else, I know I won't get my money back or somebody else. What made you believe that you would be dealing with Clayton Morris's company the entire time? Like, what made you assume uh, or go into this, you know, spend your money with the knowledge, with the thought process in your head that you would be dealing with them during the sale as well as after the sale. Why did you feel that way? Um, from listening to his podcast for a year and the information on his website, he's, he said repeatedly, done for you real estate. And so I thought this would be a good way to do my first property to kind of get an idea of the things that transpired during a real estate transaction and, and setting up to um, invest in a real estate property, but it is repeated innumerable times on his podcast as well as listed on his website. How did you hear about Morris Invest and how did you end up investing your money with Clayton Morris's company? So I was familiar with Clayton from Fox and Friends and uh, one weekend morning I turned on the TV just to catch the last two minutes of the program where he was, it was his last show. And, but I didn't hear anything about where he was going or what he was doing. So that prompted me, my curiosity, to get online and kind of try to find out. And um, through my search, I found out about his real estate company and, and Morris Invest. And uh, it piqued my interest because for many years, I've been interested in real estate investing. Uh, I had started to look into it 
in my early 20s and life got in the way and I just never went down that road. And so um, then I, you know, found his podcast through that search and started listening and started learning more about it and uh, listened to those podcasts for about a year before I, um, well, earlier on than that, I made a phone call to Mars Invest to find out what his program was about. And um, meanwhile, kind of worked towards getting uh, a HELOC so that I could move forward with investing. How much money did you end up investing with Clayton's company? Just about $120,000. And how was your experience with investing? How did things turn out with that $120,000 investment? So uh, in July of 2018, we purchased our first property that was, um, I think, about $57,000. This was located in Detroit. It was um, advertised as a tenanted um, rehabbed property. And then a couple of weeks later, as that was finishing going through the process, we decided where well, we would go ahead and purchase our second property. And um, so then our second one was in the same area, in the Detroit metro area. And that one was, um, I think it was 60, 62,000, And that property was also advertised as a completed rehab, tenanted property. And after closing, I found out that that wasn't true. It had not even been rehabbed, let alone had a tenant. And I showed them the listing that they had sent me that said that information, that it was tenanted. And they said they didn't know how that got on there, but that it was not tenanted. And it was not rehabbed yet. I, I figured it would be about 90 days. That's what they say on, on the podcast. That's what they told me when we found out this hadn't been renovated. So um, getting closer to that 90, or maybe about the 60 day, I you know, emailed Morris and said, I wanted to check in to see how this is going. And they sent some pictures at some point. Um, 90 days came and went and I asked about the property again. Uh, this was, they said that the rental had been completed. They were just waiting on replacement windows. So no tenant was placed yet. Now we're getting, you know, into November, December. And so every couple of weeks I would email and ask, you know, how, how is this coming along? How is it progressing? I'm still waiting on the windows. And, and it always was curious to me of why we were waiting on windows months down the road when the rental supposedly started in July. You know, why is it six months to get windows? Um, and so in... This kept recurring, and then finally in March, I, we received a call from the property management company, which actually changed hands uh, in October. Someone bought out the original property management company. Um, this property management company called us, um, I think it was March 3rd, to tell us there had been a fire at the property, and um, they didn't know the damage, they didn't have, you didn't really have any information to give us other than that. So we really had to get on the phone and try to get people to give us information, get pictures for us, and try to let us know what happened there. And because the home had been sitting empty since January with a hole in the roof from the fire, there was um, significant damage to the inside of the home. There was a total loss. Well, I would, ass I would assume the home was probably empty since July the year before, no? Correct, correct, but at least it had a roof on it. <laughs> okay, so we don't think that the roof, uh, the roof uh, damage occurred till January, probably in a storm or something of that nature? Uh, in the fire. So the fire was not in March? No, it ha actually occurred in January. Once we were, it took us uh, about six weeks to actually obtain the fire report. And that's when we found out it was in January. To clarify, they didn't tell you about the fire till at least 60 days after it occurred? Yes. 
Uh, the fire occurred January 11th, and we weren't notified until the first week of March. As of today, as I'm talking to you, how much of your initial investment with Morris Invest have you lost? A good $60,000. The second home is currently vacant. I'm having to pay um, fees to store the HVAC and the water heater so that it doesn't get stolen and pay for property upkeep. I'm trying to sell the home to a wholesaler, but there's been problems on the title on the, the second home. Um, I've been for over two months trying to work out the issues with the title. Having to store your HVAC and your hot water tank and things of that nature because the risk of theft is so great would indicate to me as, as a longtime real estate investor that that means the particular property you had purchased from Morris Invest is in a very high risk neighborhood, you know, the ghetto, so to speak. Was that presented to you? Was the risk of the neighborhood presented to you when they were trying to sell you this home? Not at all. And from listening to the podcast and um, in other places, uh, Clayton frequently talked about um, the homes that costing about $30,000. And so since my homes um, were more than that, especially the one that had not been rehabbed yet, uh, I, I thought that you know, that might be a little bit better area than what he might typically build in or rehab in. What type of tenant base was he explaining to you that you get? Because there's even been shows out there where Clayton had mentioned that perhaps doctors or nurses like to live in some of their properties. You being in the medical field yourself, would this be the type of neighborhood you would ever consider living in? Yes, I've heard him say that, and I've thought about that many times. And and this is not a neighborhood that you would um, find the working professionals, I think he maybe called it, including hospital employees, nurses, et cetera. Knowing what you know today, would you ever consider investing with Morris Invest or Clayton Morris again? No. I would um, caution anyone who's even remotely considering it. Uh, at the time, I wasn't aware of how active he is in keeping his online reputation stellar. I, before I invested, I tried to vet it out and see if there were any problems. And at the time, I could only find one video, and so I thought, well, there's, you know, there's always one, one person in the crowd that you can't make happy no matter what you do. So I, I dismissed that, um, that one that I could find and I looked very hard to try to find any any kind of comments, any kind of videos, any kind of um, reports. And at that point when I was, you know, making the decision to invest, there, there wasn't anything out there. And even now with the stories coming out about him, it's still difficult to find information. You know, if, if you're somebody who like I was at that point trying to look and find that it's it's getting more, but um, he's very active in trying to keep his online reputation stellar. How did you feel when you found out that Clayton Morris had fled the United States after all the lawsuits came out and he actually left and went to Portugal? Uh, I was very angry um, and that cemented in my mind that he was aware of the problems. I would think that somebody who was forthright would want to take care of the is issues as they arose and Leaving the country was just cowardly, and um, it's, it makes you very angry. I, I really don't know what to say. If, if you had the opportunity, if Clayton Morris was sitting in front of you right now, and you had the opportunity to ask him anything you wanted, what would you say to Clayton Morris? I'm not sure. I haven't thought about that, but I think I would ask him um, why he won't make things right. Well, I appreciate that. Are you going to include all the lawsuits that have been dismissed? I mean, I'm telling you that now, so you have that as homework. You also have the other massive 
default uh, judgment that came from the judge against Bert. Yeah. And that's just the tip of the iceberg for him. You, you've got that included in the piece. Right. Again, for, again strategy, I'm not going to, like, you're not going to edit my video and I'm not going to like, like run everything that's going in, like by you at this moment in time. Like we're not doing that. Mike, you're a little bit different than a lot of the investors we've spoke to. Uh, you are not actually a new uh, investor. The, the majority of the folks we've been talking to, it seems to be one of their very first investments, but you've actually uh, been involved in out-of-state investing for some time now? Yes, yes, I've, I've had a number of properties over the last few years. Okay, and you, how many properties have you purchased from Morris and his, uh, his group of companies? Well, I, I had intended on purchasing a couple of properties from him, but I only got to one. Typically, when I do a rental property, I like to buy a property and get it functional and cash flowing positively and make sure I'm comfortable with it before I make any further investments. So with his situation, I, I bought one property with, with all things uh, supposedly, according to the contract, it would have been just fine. But it took me nearly two years to get it to cash flow. What... Uh, let's let's take a look at that deeper. What specifically was in the contract um, laid out in that contract verse that was different than what you actually had received? Well, I mean, I had made it uh, clear that I needed a, needed a new roof and a new furnace. Those are the two big ticket items that I had made sure was actually written in the contract and in in our email um, correspondence as well. And that was agreed upon by everybody. Now, now aside from well, I don't want to uh, cut you off, but just to clarify for everyone watching, when you say you're going back and you're getting this written in the contract, new roof and new furnace, yes. who yes. are you negotiating with specifically? Uh, what company? Like, who are you specifically speaking with? Yeah. Uh, the actual agent of his was, his name was James, who was one okay. of his sales representative. So, so, so James is a sales representative working at Morris Invest. Yes. Okay. And he, he was getting, he was getting approval from, from Clayton on the deal at that time. Okay. So you're going back and forth, negotiating the terms of this deal. Uh, James is your point of contact at Morris Invest. James gets approval from Clayton himself to go ahead and write it in there that you can get a new roof and a new furnace. And then presumably you guys go ahead and close the deal. And uh, the, there was one other thing as uh, the contract was being written, I, I wanted to make sure this was a Section 8 uh, process. So I had a Section 8 tenant in place. So I wanted to make sure that the Section 8 inspection was recently conducted and that all of the items on that list were at least buttoned up, which would mean like uh, they would test the, the railings and the paint and the smoke detectors and the electrical and the, the basic plumbing checks. Those are what a Section 8 inspection goes through there's a, a long punch list on that. That's why I would use a Section 8 uh, uh, property from a distance. That's one of the reasons I like using Section 8 if I'm going to do it. It's because I have that another layer of inspection. So all the Section 8 items need to be up to speed. And then the new big ticket items were a furnace and a roof. That okay. was written in our, in our purchase contract. Now, I purchased the property um, over the appraised value with those in mind was because I knew I was going to have to spend a lot of money to do that if I didn't. So that was the idea. Okay. So what did you end up purchasing it for and what did it appraise for? Uh, well, I didn't do an independent appraisal afterward, but I initially, when I purchased the property from him was 51, nine. Okay. So $51,900. Uh, the section eight tenant has still actually is still my tenant in that house. So thankfully this was a, this worked out well. Uh, on the tenant side, sometimes it doesn't work out well for the buying side and the tenant side. In this situation, the tenant remained and it is actually a, a decent tenant. I, I have to say, I do enjoy her. She's a very good tenant. So no, no problems with that. Okay. So that, so he sold your property for 51,900 claimed there's section eight tenant and there, there was, you still have that tenant to this day. That's that true. sounds great. What's the issue here? Uh, the issue was uh, when we purchased the property, the, the roof and the furnace weren't installed. Um, after I had spent the better part of a year getting that to be done, I don't think it was done very well if it was ever done at all, because we still have had problems with the furnace and other issues that develop on the backside of the roof. So if they were new, I, I don't know how well that was done. 
Second, it took a year to get done. Um, third, when you say it took you a year, so I just want to make sure I understand this. He was supposed to, you know, you guys agreed that that would be installed before you closed the deal, but that didn't happen. So you, how did you find out that that didn't happen after? Uh, like, we, yeah, we had to continue. Uh, had, I had to have inspections done and take a look, look at the house and make sure that it was up to speed. When the furnace broke down, of course, I knew it wasn't new. Uh, that, that didn't take long to figure out. I'm spending four or $500 to repair furnaces. Uh, second, I had a Section 8 inspection come around again because I was going to uh, re-rent re the place or renew the lease to the tenant. So Section 8 has to come around and do another assessment to see if they're going to raise the rent or not uh, to recalibrate, I guess, the, the monthly fee. They did that, and I got pictures of all of these punch list items that were also not done. There's no smoke detectors, no GFC outlets, GFCI outlets, no, the railings uh, were all rusted and rickety on the front and back. The, fence was destroyed on the side of the yard all, all these things were just you know a couple thousand dollars worth of repairs that were supposed to have been buttoned up before we even took over the property so when you find all this out through the section 8 inspections right i presume your first course of action is to go back to morris invest and you're like hey what the hell well first thing was uh i repaired all the items i still had a tenant living in the house so i'm not going to sit there and fight over three or four thousand dollars with somebody when I have to fix a house so I fixed everything and there was a plumbing issue as well there was probably three thousand dollar plumbing problem in in the basement and another three or four thousand dollar repair bill over all over the house from shutters to back roof and all sorts of places uh, so it was it was a quick expense uh, sending him another letter at this point after for about eight or nine months of trying to get these initial repairs done I didn't even bother harassing him for more. I didn't think it was going to be worth my time to chase him down for it. Uh, I've unfortunately been through that a few times, but I also know, you know, it's ultimately my responsibility to make sure that the house is very, very livable. I don't, I don't take that lightly. I like to have a nice house for my tenants. Would you ever consider investing with Morris Invest again? Uh, not, not at this time. Why is that? Uh, I, I just like the transparency and the trust and the the actual relationship needed to be done properly from the beginning. I mean, if everything on the contract was as such, I wouldn't have any issues. But, you know, I feel like there was a lot of uh, people in the dark on this one. They didn't know what they were even selling. How much money would you say was guaranteed to you in this contract that you actually didn't receive? Like of all the I, of all the items that you negotiated to yeah. get put in that contract, what yeah, roughly was, was the value that they didn't actually give to you? If it was around fifteen thousand dollars, I'd be. I think that's probably reasonable. Um, you know, meaning the the house, if it appraised for thirty five or thirty eight thousand dollars, and I bought it for fifty one, I'm like, I did the math a few times, and all the things that I saw needed to be done. In that somewhere in that ballpark, I would say that's probably what was expected on my end. You know, the brand new roof, a new furnace, you know, a hot water tank. If it wasn't new, very close to new. Electrical should have been buttoned up, uh, which is like GFCI. The plumbing should have been checked and, and cleared out if there's any issues, which there were. Um, any of the main Section 8 items that should have been there that would have failed inspection if it was conducted properly. Did you ever get any compensation for this 15000 15, or so uh, shortage? No, I just moved on. I've been through a few uh, different situations in the past. I'd rather avoid... <laughs> any sort of legal if I can avoid it it's just not very effective unfortunately when it comes to that little bit of money I know it sounds like a lot of money it's not enough to be uh, going to court over in my opinion that number is garbage and you know there's another company in Indianapolis well that's the thing I, that's the thing Clay. that's why I'm not understanding what you're doing you're telling me here bro because like he's on a record saying one thing I have no evidence to uh, prove that what he said is incorrect you are apparently the only guy that has some type of evidence that proves that, but you don't want to talk about it. So I don't even want you to do. If you're a documentary, if you're a, if you're a documentary filmmaker, you go find it. I mean, this is what a journalist does. Are you a journalist, or what? I mean, what are you? Well, I'm not your fucking. I'm not your errand boy. I haven't found anything, and you're telling me I gotta go find it. I'm not your errand boy. That's not how this works. <laughs> Instead of hanging out bigger pockets, why don't you actually go meet with Jack Schechter? and Jack Gibson in fucking Indianapolis who ran high return real estate. They were there in the city. They have hundreds of properties 
from Ocean Point. The exact same thing happened to them. They then had to move all of their properties over to Urban House, other property management companies who literally had hundreds of people. We've moved our properties over to Urban House. They're like, oh my God, we had hundreds from high return real estate that worked with Ocean Point, got totally fucked by Ocean Point. And their clients were in a shit storm, way, way worse. And mm -hmm. Urban House got flooded with properties from high return real estate. Now, when you first did your, uh, you know, your first few deals with Burt Whalen, how did uh, everything transpire? Were these deals smooth? Were they easygoing or were there red flags right from the start? No, everything from the very beginning was, to me, felt very much on the up and up. I got a great vibe from Burt. We did, um, I mean, I even stayed at his guest room and his, his house multiple times. I, I never, in the beginning, I never really felt like there was any red flags my instincts weren't like on high alert at all i mean the business model made sense everything he told me made sense it seemed like a pretty straightforward operation you buy a property at a discount that needs rehab you'd send a construction team in rehab the property place a tenant and send the investor a check for purchasing the property so at that point what was uh the relationship like with you and bert like specifically what was your involvement in these deals? Were you just buying them yourself and he was handling the asset for you on the ground? Were you selling them to other folks? Where were you guys at right then and there? So when I first started, I was, I was not looking to do real estate. I have a very, very successful multi-million dollar nutrition distribution um, operation. I was looking for a safe place to or so I thought, right, to place my, <laughs> to place my, um, my capital. And I had looked around at other markets and prices were pretty high and the returns and it didn't really make sense for the amount of risk. So looking at Indianapolis, uh, the city was three hours from my house. It made sense. So I just started buying up as a turnkey buyer. Um, I, I bought up to, I was up to 15 units with Bert, all, all properties that I bought through him and things were going great. I mean, I'm getting incredible returns on my, that first batch based on the price to rent ratios. Um, he, he had them 14 out of 15 were leased and performing for the first uh, 12 months. So I got excited. I mean, when I believe in something, I feel pretty strong about my ability to sell it. So I started, you know, referring other investors left and right from my, you know, network of trusted, you know, people over the last 20 years that I've built up you know, that trust equity with them, right? So when I told him that it was working, it was good. He's a good stand-up guy. You know, they moved. And so I sold $5 million in, you know, just in cash real estate, just through referrals. And at first, Bert would just give me a, a discount off my rehabs. And then, you know, as I started scaling more and more, it just didn't make sense. It made sense to, you know, pay me out of commission. So he would start to uh, send me wires and, I was getting more excited and that's about the time where I realized I needed to bring in a, a partner to help me to scale the company. I could only do so much myself. I knew that we needed to do some digital marketing. We needed to create a nice website presence, a podcast, a brand, and I just didn't have the bandwidth to do it myself. So that's when I brought in and recruited Shecky here to be my 50-50 equity partner in high return real estate. So when Shecky came in, you know, we were very, very, still very much, um, you know, working with Bert at that time. Originally, we thought we were just going to have a sales and marketing company, and we were just going to promote Ocean Point stuff because when I, I, I wasn't from Indianapolis, but when I flew up here and met all the parties, like Jack said, everything seemed like it was all on the up and up. And, you know, we started with them, you know, basically as far as doing everything, you know, the acquisitions and the rehabs and the property management, but um, it did not take very long for the wheels to fall off at that point. We just started seeing some real uh, significant problems just in terms of any relationship with any supplier and uh, really, really lacking in communication and really having a good idea of where our investors were at with their performance. That was kind of the first big red flag that we noticed is we just weren't getting answers on anything. And we had a lot of investors reaching out to us saying that they, you know, couldn't get in touch with the property management teams. And, uh, you know, we were very much sucked into quite a bit of additional customer service that we were not planning on.
what was like that time frame? Was it like uh, everything was smooth for like the first year and then the following six months it got rocky? Can you kind of walk me through like, you know, what started to happen, how many units were sold and, and like what ultimately led you uh, to make that decision to, to cut ties with Wayland? Yeah, for me, from the time that I started buying, which would have been January of 2016, um, it wasn't until the following like August of 2017 that I really started like just really seeing some things that, that I really didn't like. So Shecky and I had only been together maybe what, a few months? Yeah. yeah. I would you be able to give me an example of some of those things you saw that you didn't like? Like, what did you see? What were the flags? Well, I'd have investors. The, the main, the biggest thing is what Shecky kind of alluded to there. You know, lots of investors that I, you know, brought in, they're coming back and hitting me up and being like, I can't get a hold of anybody at Ocean Point. I, you know, I've got all these liens that I'm getting against my property and, and I'm getting no answers on. There's, you know, the, the, stacks and stacks of city code violations are starting to kind of pile up on a lot of their properties. And, you know, I'm not getting any answers about, you know, leases. You know, one time I went into the leasing office to try to make sense of what's going on, like what's leased up, what's not, how do we get these performing? And that's right when I realized like that something's very, very wrong here. And I, I, I just don't want to be a part of this. This just doesn't, it's no, it's just not adding up. So, you know, that's when Shecky and I had a conversation and, you know, look, I'm a very loyal guy and probably to a fault. And Shecky's like, cause I didn't really want to, you know, this was, it wasn't bad enough. Right. I didn't know of any fraud. I just knew it. I just felt it was disorganized and chaotic. And Shecky's like, look, dude, you're so loyal, but like we've got to sever ties with these guys. So it was, it was a good push from Shecky to say, Hey, you know, this, this is not, this is not working out. And then it wasn't until March of 2018 that we really had a full understanding of just how bad the whole situation was. Yeah. So specific examples, just so you, people kind of have a picture of what happened. So one of them, my investor, Lisa, I've known her for 20 years. She's very important to me. And, you know, I, as far as how, how important i mean she's she's produced millions of dollars of sales revenue in my other company right so i brought her in as an investor she purchased a quadruplex on grand avenue in indy and she paid eighty five thousand for it and it was supposed to have about a forty thousand dollar rehab so the property um when the everything kind of collapsed in march when the email went out um lisa had been getting Three units of rent. She'd what, been getting Jack, real quick, what email specifically are you referring to in March? I just want to make sure we have that clarified. Uh, so an email went out to 250 Ocean Point investors stating that the property management of Ocean Point had been is dissolved per se. Okay. And that basically that when that email went out, the property management had changed to a different property manager. I believe it was because Bert, uh, his license had been revoked or something along those, those lines where he couldn't actually, he wasn't operating under his own license. He had been operating under somebody else's license the whole time. So that um, the, the gentleman that he was operating under figured out that things weren't on the up and up. So he said, my name's on the line here. I'm taking over all these properties. So that's the short of that. When that happened um, and the email went out, I started getting pinged from all my referral investors saying, I want to sell, buy this back for me. I want out. My rents just went down by 60, 70, 80% in some cases where they're getting Lisa, who is getting $1,500 a month in rent, or there's actually 700, 1700. Her rent, her rent check went to zero. Okay. okay hold on. Let, let me just <clears throat> make sure I, I got this. So you're saying, Prior to that email going out and the change happening, you've got a bunch of investors out there that their properties are, are producing relatively consistently and the returns are pretty stable, mm -hmm. but then the property management changes and then the performance just immediately, like with the flip of a switch changed? 
Absolutely. Flip of a switch. Every single investor that I had, their rent statement dropped by big, big percentages. How many investors would you say that was roughly? 30. 30 investors accounting for the, I think you said it earlier, roughly 100 or so units? Yes, 130 yeah. units. So between my 15 and then other properties that Sheck and I had purchased from Ocean Point to rehab and um, to turn to our investor, you know, new investor purchases network, um, and then all the people that I had already sold to, it was roughly 130 units. What would you infer attributed to that immediate drop in performance? Was the new property management company not a good management company? Or do you have any inclination of why the drop occurred? Well, you know, there's, there's only really one thing that makes sense. You know, I don't have any proof per se of that it actually transpired this way. But, uh, you know, there was tenants where you know, once we kind of went in and took the properties over from that property manager that had taken over for Ocean Point, you know, we discovered mostly vacant units, dilapidated units, um, most, uh, squatters, um, leases that were for three, four hundred dollars a month. And the rent that had been paid out was six, seven hundred dollars per month to the investor. So nothing, it just nothing made sense. Why are investors <clears throat> getting money every single month like clockwork on a C-class property where, and no maintenance is ever being charged to them. They're just getting perfect straight rent every single month. But then we find out that the, all the units are vacant, squatting. It didn't make sense. Yeah, and that that would probably not uh, <clears throat> occur in the normal, you know, operation of a rental property. Obviously, we have ebbs and flows, and we do get vacancies. But yeah, it doesn't typically happen in a wave like that. Mm. And uh, when you guys actually got some physical eyes on these properties, which like you could typically as an investor tell uh, if a unit was just lived in and the tenant just moved out like a day or two ago versus like a a unit that had been vacant for a considerable amount of time. Was that mm -hmm. your experience? You're looking at units that appear to have been vacant for a considerable amount of time, not just when that switch occurred. We had, there was quite a bit of a mix. There was, you know, there was, there were some that had squatters living in them that were, you know, that could not produce any lease or um, couldn't verify or show that they, any records that they had been paying rent at all. Um, there were, there were certain properties that looked like they had just recently vacated. There was a mix that it's like nobody had ever lived there for a year. There were properties where like the, the property I'm alluding to on Grand, the water had never even been turned on for the last, it, it had been turned on for years. But so, yet there was an investor who was receiving rental income checks for that property the entire time. Absolutely. We had lots of instances where water had not had ever been turned on on the property for the time period that the investor had been receiving rent checks. What did you guys, what actions did you guys take uh, to handle those investors' needs and mitigate their losses uh, after you decide it's time to cut, cut ties with Waylon? Well, that's a, that's a long answer, James. I mean, it's, um, <clears throat> there was a number of things that happened. Obviously, there were many investors that had already reached out to us and we were already in conversation with them. For the ones that hadn't, we reached out to them. We obviously need, needed an immediate property management solution, and we were able to partner up with a very nice gentleman that ran a, a locally owned company here that you know kind of helped us through that tougher situation on the management side, and there was a lot to work through. So just to clarify, Shecky, yeah. originally... It was Ocean Point handling the PM, and right. even though some of these properties did not have water on, the money was coming in monthly. Correct. But then Ocean Point, because of Wayland's license status with the state of Indiana, all Ocean Point property management as a brokerage ceased to exist. They kicked it over to one company. Mm -hmm. That's when your personal property and all of your 30 some odd investors performance immediately dipped and you two have now been made aware of the situation you're in. At that point, you two yourselves took your group of investors and moved to a complete new management company, a third management company. Correct. So yep. now, okay. So now you guys 
have completely severed all ties with everything that has occurred thus far, and you guys are essentially starting fresh. Correct. Well, yeah, I wouldn't be use the word fresh, but yeah, we're, <laughs> we're starting over. Um, and obviously, it was pretty hellacious just trying to get stuff moved over to that property management company because even, even the change from Burke to whoever uh, the other entity was, they were, it was the same thing. They were just uncooperative and non-communicative. So there was very much a lot of things that we had to just figure out for ourselves and some of it was guesswork and things like that. But yeah, we had to go into every single property and assess what was going on and come up with some recommendations. You know, some properties obviously were in really, really piss poor condition. Some were not so bad. Uh, there were many investors that just said, you know, screw it, I just want to sell. And, you know, for those, we tried to help them sell them off, you know, through a number of methods, whether it's, you know, listing them on the MLS or some of them we... Uh, partnered with them on getting them fixed up and, you know, reselling them through our own investor network or other potential networks. And uh, that worked out fairly well. I mean, we bore, as Jack said, much of the financial burden for doing this kind of stuff because we felt um, an obligation to those investors. There were some extreme situations where we actually bought the property back. And we just started fresh and started with a brand new rehab and brand new processes and eventually turned it into a nice property and got it tenanted and sold it as a turnkey company to a completely new investor with, you know, fresh energy, no history, any of that kind of stuff. So there were, there were a number of those, but you know, we're like we're now two years later and we're still feeling the effects of it. We, like I said earlier, we've only got maybe half a dozen or so properties left like this that are, still feeling the effect of the previous, you know, mistakes that we made from that association. But we just did whatever was necessary. Sometimes it was just fixing it up. Sometimes it was selling it off. Sometimes it was buying it back. Sometimes it was a mixture, you know, it just whatever needed to happen. We just did it. And there were the, thankfully the investors we had good relationship with and some of them understood that we could not do this all at once. One of the things that we felt really bad about was that, some of these people had to wait a year before we could even touch their property. Mm -hmm. And that was a situation with a lot of other investors that bought through networks outside of ours, but were still affected by that too, because you got to understand there were so many, when this email hit, this affected not just our investors, but hundreds, hundreds of investors that had been exposed to this problem in the Indianapolis market. And there forget about finding a good contractor. You couldn't even find a contractor. They were all just so ridiculously busy. And then what's sad is there became this whole, uh, you know, sort of separate market, almost like a black market to quote unquote, take care of these investors that had been affected by that. And, you know, many of them sold off at huge losses. Like there were, you know, wholesalers playing vulture. And I mean, it was not a pretty situation. Mm -hmm. And um, so we saw a lot of that going on and just said, okay, let's at least alert, alert our investors to this situation so they're not sucked in by the black marketeers. And even if they've got a wait a year, let's at least come up with some sort of solution where they're not going to have this extreme amount of damage as if they were just being poached. So, you know, we just did whatever we could. Yeah, so James, I'd like to give a couple of uh, specific advan uh, examples of properties where we, you know, stepped in and, and really saved uh, some some investor, you know, losses substantial. Uh, Lisa's property on uh, Grand, one of my dear friends, long time, twenty years in business together, and my other company. I mean, she she bought a quad for eighty five grand. It was going to get forty in rehab, and the uh, when when everything the shit hit the fan in March, her rent went from seventeen hundred down to zero. Okay, so the property turned out, there was very little rehab that had ever been done to it. If she would have sold it on the open market, she would have been lucky to get 20 grand back out. Um, maybe on a really, really good day, 30,000, but I really had my doubts. So we went in and I put in my own money, I rehabbed it, put 50 grand back into the property of my own money. 
And then we ended up selling it for 115,000, uh, fully performing with all four real tenants paying. And uh, Lisa got paid back out at closing um, $80,000. So she was made whole between her, what she got back and then the rent she had uh, received. And I pocketed the other, you know, what is 35,000. So I ended up taking a $15,000 hit on that. And then after we sold it, it turned out we needed additional work. Um, so I put another 15 grand back into the property to keep, to, for the new investor to take care of them. So, you know, I told Lisa the other day, I'm like, you realize I lost 30 grand on your property to get your money back out. And we sold it commission free. And she's like, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm just going to start selling some more product. I'll make, you know, I'll make the money back for you. So <laughs> I'm like, okay, get to work. <laughs> and then another um, friend of mine, Ed, he had a property on 18th street. It was two single families on one lot. He bought it for 55,000. He got rent for about six months and then uh, the rent check stopped and um, turned out it had some major, uh, major structural foundation issues. They both, both houses needed new roofs. I mean, it, they were disasters. So um, that is one of our final properties that need to be still are finishing up rehab. It's scheduled to get done by the end of next week. And I put uh, 45,000 so far of my own money back into his property because he didn't have the funds to fix it back up. We've got it under contract for a hundred. So I'm going to get, you know, maybe 40,000 of Ed's 55 back. Look, there's some situations like Shecky said, it's like almost impossible despite our best efforts to get an investor like 100% whole. Um, some situations that worked out like with Lisa and, and I took a big hit, you know, other situations it's like we, we just had to draw the line and say, this is, this is the best that we can do for you. And we're still, we're still stepping up to the plate to mitigate your losses. So, uh, you know, thank, thankfully, like people like investors like Ed are very patient. You know, he's just been the last year, he's been like, hey, man, I get it. It's not your fault. When you can get to it, get to it. I know you'll take care of me. So that's, that's how we've had. And then we've had other investors, you know, that, um, to be honest, James, like there's there's two or three that are not fans of, you know, Jack Gibson <laughs> that uh, I sold property to. But those were ones where, you know, they had, you know, one of them had 15 units that all needed 30, 40,000 of work on each property. What was the total financial loss on your company in relation to all this? Like how much did you guys have to actually put in? It's really hard to put a, a firm number on it. Um, our company lost 275000 last year alone. Um, not all of that can be attributed to the Ocean Point. We also had another, um, you know, a rehab team that, uh, you know, didn't follow through with, with what we paid them to do. So by and large, though, it was, um, you know, it was definitely a, a, a probably in the tune of four or $500,000 or more. This was a really tough struggle for a younger company. I mean, we, we were selling other properties all along and obviously we needed to, to be able to stay afloat. But there, there were many situations because of the money that we had put into previous investors property, we were having a hard time making payroll. I mean, it was, there, there was more than once that it was touch and go and we were in danger of going out of business. Has Burt Whalen ever attempted in any way to mitigate the losses that you and your investors suffered during this whole process? Not one time. Not once. Never reached out. Never said, uh, there was never a text, not one correspondence sent at any time that would have said, hey, what can I do to help? What can I do to mitigate this? I mean, it was, it was like we were the enemy to him. Thank, thank God I had another business that had, was already established and built. I had to rob that business of its, a lot of its monthly revenue and pull that over into high return real estate just to keep the company, you know, payroll going, keep our marketing going and, and to keep this thing alive. So, you know, it was, a, as Shecky said, a, I think for any company to go through it, established or otherwise would have been rough. 
but to to be one year in and you're just getting the ball, you know, you're just getting your roots established and getting a trying to get your name out there, and you have to not only try to focus on generating new business so you can stay afloat, but you're dealing with this every single day from the moment you wake up till you go to bed. <clears throat> it was um, to say that that it was a struggle would be quite an understatement. The question I have for you now is: Do you guys think that? you know, how you handled it after the shit hit the fan versus how Clayton Morris and his company Morris Invest have handled a similar situation, albeit on a much larger scale. Do you guys, what are some of the big differences in how um, each camp proceeded forward when it hit the fan? (laughs) Uh, It's a tough question. I mean, I don't, I don't really want to point fingers. I mean, look, we, we had a, what was it, Jack, 100, 130 doors probably that were affected. Yeah. And it's taken us two years pretty much to work through that. Um, Clayton was operating on a much bigger scale. And so to be able to do what we did for our investors, whether the desire was there or not, was probably impossible for him just because of the numbers that he was doing. And, you know, I like I said, we, I can't make any ethical judgments about what anybody else is doing. Uh, we just know what we, we felt that we had to do. One thing that is very different about how we approach the situation on the onboarding process is that when we marketed and sold a property that was an Ocean Point rehab and Ocean Point management, I mean, we never made any claims or made any sort of reference that said that this is our team. There was a, always a very clear separation. We said this, yes, our company is high return real estate, but this is a sales and marketing entity and we are selling an ocean point product. So we never, we never said, yeah, this, this whole operation is ours. The rehab teams is ours. We never misrepresented to our investor base that, that we're in charge of the whole thing. So when the, you know, when the shit did hit the fan, you know, our investors were also very clear and understanding of the fact that yes, we sold them the property. Yes. We recommended them to them, but we didn't do the rehab. So we didn't do the property management. We didn't send out, you know, the, uh, the rent checks, (laughs) rent checks, right. We didn't do any of that. So we were in a much better position with our investors to really, lay out like here's what happened and here's what we're going to do to try to help you now as shecky said there were a lot of different uh things that uh we did to try to sell our properties but one thing we're that i was very uh, clear on with my investor base is don't make a rash decision right now when there's you're competing to try to sell your property with so many hundreds of other people that are trying to do it right now you're going to take monster losses. So I just kind of help try to keep them all patient, even though a lot of them are texting me, you know, for answers, you know, some, some daily, some were very patient and once a month type updates, but I just try to get them patient, patient, patient. It's we're much better to be patient and wait for this storm to kind of pass and then try to fix these properties back up versus just dumping them for an extreme loss. And, I believe with that strategy of just patience and even though it was the harder way to go, we preserved a lot of investor capital in, in, in it really saved a lot of people from, from some monumental losses and even helped some people to honestly make a profit, believe it or not on their ocean point properties, which was pretty, pretty difficult to accomplish. It's a, it's a tough situation. And I could, I could tell uh, that, uh, you know, it was tough on you guys as a big blow uh, to what you're trying to do as business owners. Um, what would you say, uh, have you guys learned from this? And like, what, what, what does high return real estate look like today as I talk to you two uh, versus what it looked like back then? Like, what are, you guys, are you guys doing things differently than you were doing back then before this whole thing happened? <laughs> kind of the polar opposite of those days. So, you know, Jack and I often joke, we have a podcast too, and we often joke that, you know, had we known what we were getting into, we probably would have never done this. Definitely would have never done it. <laughs> but, you know, here we are, and and the, the lessons were extremely expensive, but 
very, very valuable. So to answer your question, for example, you know, we, we obviously saw there's really two sides of problems. One is the problem with the rehab and the other is the problem with the management. So we know we're pretty good at acquisitions. We know the market pretty well. So how could we dial in good rehabs? And now, of course, over the years, we've developed relationships with really fantastic crews and we've got some people that work exclusively for us and it's really great. But we actually do two rehab or two um, inspections on a property. So we, when we go and acquire a property, the first thing we do is we turn on utilities and we then go right from there into an inspection of the property so that when our teams go in and rehab, they have their own checklist of things that they're going to look at. We, you know, obviously we check out everything on the property, but they also have the advantage of a third party inspection to work with as they're going through. So we, we very, very rarely see any surprises. When they get to the end of the rehab, we actually call for another third party inspection and we ask that it's not the same person. So we're not looking for a review of the first inspection. We're looking for a fresh set of eyes just for quality control. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's nothing that comes out perfect. You know, second inspector might find a couple other things. If there's anything that's still outstanding on that inspection report that's meaningful to a good rehab, we will send our crews back in to fix those minor little items, you know, take a picture, sign off on it, make sure everything is okay. Can I bring in my own inspector and have them look at it too? As yeah, a yeah, it's a great question. And the, the answer is yes. Um, what's interesting is because of the double inspections that we already do, we get very, very few investors that request that. But for the odd investor, which is a small percentage of them that do, that say, hey, I still want to get another set of eyes on it, by all means. You're, you're buying the property. You want to spend the money on an additional um, inspection. Uh, we have not yet seen that prove out any new information, but they're more than welcome to do that. We definitely direct them to, to if they want to purchase a property and get an additional inspection, get one that's already, that's still vacant because, you know, it really, it's quite a challenge for us once a tenant is placed and now tenants been in there a week or two and now you're already disrupting them with another person coming in and scrutinizing the property. So we prefer those from our side to smooth line, streamline everything, you know, that they do it on a vacant property. But uh, look, yeah, we, we're not ever going to tell an investor, you know, you can't order another one. If they feel they don't, uh, they need more verification, then no problem. We get it. We're going to look back on this a few years from now being like, that was a great thing that happened to us because we learned this, 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 and this, we got stronger. And now we have this amazing company that we can, you know, we can pass on, you know, to our heirs and we can be proud of the name high return real estate. And when that day comes, I mean, look, it's, it's going to be pretty special. But in the meantime, all we really want to do is get the last set of properties off the books, done, rehab, sold, everybody squared away. And then Shecky and I are going to, we're going to throw a big party. It's called the debertification party. <laughs> That's our goal. We can't wait to have this party. What I would like to do now though, I want to switch gears because there's a lot of angles to this and I wasn't actually involved in any of it personally. Everybody has their side to this story, but there is one thing and one thing only that goes without question. This is proved beyond a reasonable doubt, and that is many investors lost a lot of money. Many investors were victimized down there in Indianapolis, Indiana. A lot of money was lost. So what I want to do, I want to switch gears, and I want to move forward. What I want to focus on now is how you can avoid becoming the victim of a turnkey real estate investment scam. So we're going to go to a quick word from the sponsor of today's show, and then we are going to go over the five things you can do to avoid becoming the victim of a turnkey real estate investment scam. Rent Tech Direct provides you with an easy-to-use yet robust platform for managing your properties, complete with its built-in reporting and accounting system that can be customized to fit your business. For property managers, you get advanced features like simplified owner distributions, automated management and placement fees, an owner portal, plus the software is certified for trust accounting. All this comes backed by the highest rated customer support team in the industry. 
Certified by third parties and ranked number one by our clients year over year, you get unlimited free access to our U.S.-based support team by phone, email, and chat, who will help you getting started or anywhere along the way. All right, welcome back, folks. Let's jump right into these five things you can do to avoid becoming a victim in a turnkey real estate investment scam. The number one thing you can do, and in my opinion, this is the most important thing. If you look at that whole Clayton Morris, Morris Invest thing, a lot of investors seem to have a very similar story. They didn't take this simple and actionable step. And as you can see from all the content that's out there, they paid the price dearly. And that is hire a third party to give you a property inspection. This very simple thing you can do is going to protect your ass in these situations. Typically, when you're buying turnkey real estate, you're buying it out of state, right? You're attracted to the turnkey business because you're living in an area where real estate is really expensive. But then there's areas in the Midwest, like where I'm from, Cleveland, Ohio. That's what we do here at Holton Wise. We sell you guys properties in Cleveland, Ohio, because the prices are super low and the rents are super high. You can't touch the type of rental numbers that we touch here in Cleveland out there in California. So it can be incredibly hard for you to get your own set of eyeballs on the property and you don't necessarily have to actually get your own set of eyeballs on the property but what you do have to do is make sure you get a set of eyeballs on that property that are completely unbiased you see you need to trust but verify when you're in this industry if you're buying from a seller okay you can't just take everything they say as the gospel they could tell you the property is in X, Y, and Z condition. That's fine. That's great. You need to verify that. And if you can't look at it yourself, or even if you can look at it yourself, what you should do is get a licensed, unbiased professional in there to verify that the property is in the exact condition that you have agreed to purchase it in. When looking at this Clayton Morris thing, it appears a lot of folks didn't do that. Another thing that the people who bought from Clayton Morris didn't do is my second tip, and that is to get an appraisal. Now, I'm not saying that this always has to be a deal where you finance the property through a bank. You can still purchase properties cash, but what a lot of investors don't seem to know is that even if you purchase a property cash, you can still order your own appraisal. Again, there's nothing inherently wrong with paying cash for a real estate investment, but I really like when you guys utilize this financing because I think that's one of the most important reasons that you should use real estate as an investment vehicle. If you have $100,000, why would you want to put that $100,000 into one $100,000 property when you can utilize it as a down payment and control $400,000 worth of real estate? I believe we all agree that owning real estate for the long term creates wealth. So obviously you should want to own as much real estate as possible with the same amount of cash. Okay, it's a good appreciating asset and that is the best debt in the world so that's important and the bank guys the bank they ain't gonna let you lose their money so with the whole morris invest thing it looks like everybody was forced into paying cash now if you for whatever reason are not interested in getting debt you're debt adverse maybe you're one of those dave ramsey fans out there you don't want any debt that's fine i'm not trying to sell you on the fact that you need to get debt but you have to get that appraisal see the cool thing with the debt though is the bank they require it every time and again they ain't letting you lose their money but even if you're gonna buy that property cash even if you've decided you want to buy it cash you can still order an appraisal. See, that's a, that's a red flag too, by the way. If you're dealing with a turnkey provider and they're only making you make cash offers, you got to ask why is that? In the real estate investment space, from time to time, there's a lot of deals we run into where you do have to pay cash. But there needs to be an underlying reason for that. Number one, it's a completely distressed asset. And there's nothing wrong with buying distressed assets, guys, so long as we go back to our first tip, which is you get a third-party inspection. If you're trying to buy a turnkey asset 
and you think it's turnkey and the seller makes you pay a price that projects it as a turnkey property and then after you own it you find out you bought a distressed asset that's a huge problem but if you go in knowing you're buying an investment property that needs repairs and it's all the way beat up and you're paying a discounted price for it that's how we as real estate investors make a ton of money so in those distressed asset situations oftentimes the houses are not livable and you need to pay cash for those so that's one reason. Another reason could be it's a non-conforming property. Uh, we see this in the Cleveland market a lot of times uh, where there will be parcels where there is not one, but there's actually two homes on the lot. Current building codes do not allow for you to build two separate homes on a lot of these residential lots. Back in the day when these homes weren't, uh, were built, building codes and zoning restrictions uh, were a lot looser back in the day. So what can happen now, the city, they're not going to make you tear these second homes down, but what can happen a lot is uh, if you are to try to purchase these with a lender, the lender is going to see that the city isn't going to let you rebuild both structures in the event of a fire. Now, some lenders are fine with that so long as the insurance company doesn't have a problem insuring the entire purchase. Other lenders are like, ah, you can't rebuild both structures because of the, z the, the new building and zoning codes, so we're not going to lend to you. So in those situations, the seller may say, hey, you got to pay cash. See, those are two underlying reasons why you would have to pay cash. So don't think just because someone tells you, hey, you have to pay cash, they're automatically screwing you. You have to dive a little deeper and see why they're making you pay cash. If you're buying a very standard and typical turnkey property, it's supposed to have been renovated, ready to go, has a tenant in there. We're talking a single family home or a duplex, and it's you know just regularly priced. There is no real reason you should have to pay cash for that type of an asset other than the seller believes they are selling it to you for a price higher than what it's going to actually appraise for. So that's why, folks, getting an appraisal is my second thing that you can do to avoid being the victim of a turnkey scam. The third thing that you can do to avoid being the victim of one of these turnkey scams, guys, is do your research on the neighborhood you know, I see a lot of people out there on the internet, and I answer these questions frequently. They're asking, what market should I invest in? Should I invest in the Cleveland market? Should I invest in the Indianapolis market? Should I invest in the Memphis market? You know, there's a lot of really popular turnkey markets out there, okay? What's more important than what turnkey market you invest in, guys, is what type of asset in what particular neighborhood in that market you invest in. That's what's really important. If you're buying like five or six or seven or eight or 10 or even 20 homes, guys, the varying differences between like the Cleveland market or the Indianapolis market or the Detroit market, you know, they're very small. You're essentially splitting hairs. You're more or less going to most likely see similar returns depending on what market you invest in. Where you're really going to start to see your major sways in your profit and losses is what type of assets you buy in these markets. So what you need to look at is the type of neighborhoods. That's why I created the ultimate guide to grading Cleveland neighborhoods and I also did the ultimate guide to grading Birmingham, Alabama neighborhoods. And then stay tuned to Holton Wise TV because we're going to be putting out these guides for all the other turnkey markets in the coming years. We have a few scheduled for 2020. As a matter of fact, we already have the ultimate guide to grading Indianapolis neighborhoods and the ultimate guide to grading Memphis neighborhoods scheduled for Q1 and Q2 of 2020. So if you're not yet subscribed to Holton Wise TV, make sure you smash that subscribe button so you get a notification when those guides come out. The thing with these guides is it allows you to see the asset level that you're getting, the type of neighborhood you're getting, the type of ownership experience you're going to have. I'm not saying that every real estate investor in the world has to invest in super low risk neighborhoods. Money can be made in the higher risk neighborhoods. When you're in those C and D neighborhoods, you can make a lot of money. But what I am telling you guys, if you're a brand new real estate investor out there, you're incredibly new to this business, to this game, 
don't go buying a property in a high-risk neighborhood in one of these new markets. Again, I really don't think what market you pick is as big of a deal as what you pick in that market. Buy yourself something safe. Pick something in a high C-class or B-class neighborhood, maybe like a little bungalow, just something super low-key, right? You got to walk before you can run. You got to ride your bike with training wheels before you start flying down the street. Same thing here. So when you're looking at these markets, make sure the neighborhoods that you're in are lower risk at the beginning of your career. If you buy a couple and you start to really like the real estate investment space and you start to build up some more cash reserves and have some more money that you can utilize and you can put into higher risk situations in an effort to make a higher return, fine, go to the higher risk properties. But at the very beginning, why? What is the point? Don't do it. Play your money safely, right? Get your bearings in the business, and then when you're established, go for the higher risk shots. Moving on to the fourth thing you guys can do to avoid becoming the victim of a turnkey scam is ensuring that the people you are dealing with are licensed professionals, right? In every state in the United States of America, you are required to hold a real estate license to sell real estate that you do not own and earn a fee or a commission. If you remember from the beginning of the show, I spoke with Clayton Morris about the fact that he is not actually a licensed real estate agent. So Clayton, you either own the properties and you're selling them to investors. Clayton says, no, 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 I didn't own any of them. All I did is earn a fee of $6,000 for selling them. So that right there tells you the type of character that you're dealing with. If you're dealing with someone who knows, or maybe they don't even know, they're just oblivious to the fact that by law you need to be licensed to earn a fee for selling real estate in the United States. That also applies to the management of real estate, not just the sale of real estate. More or less in all 50 states of the United States of America, there is a requirement that property managers need to be licensed real estate agents or licensed real estate brokers. This is incredibly important because when you're entrusting a property manager with your asset, these are some of the largest assets you have. And a ton of money flows in and out of a property manager's doors on a monthly basis. You know, there are a lot of like serious regulations and things that the state will do to ensure you're working with good actors. You know, one incredibly important thing is trust accounting. Here at Holton Wise, we have incredible standards we need to meet in regards to our trust accounting. At any given point in time, if you were to look into our trust accounts, we are holding five hundred six hundred seven hundred thousand dollars of client money not to mention all of the tenants money that comes in as rent which shall eventually become the clients money after fees and deductions are taken out so you know millions of dollars are flowing in and out of our bank accounts every single month and we have to provide those records to the state whenever we are audited by the Division of Real Estate. More or less, all 50 states are going to have similar uh, systems in place to ensure that that money is safeguarded. These are things that real estate investors don't typically think about. And when you deal with only licensed individuals, you know that those people were never involved in any crimes of moral turpitude. So if you've been involved in any major fraud allegations or lawsuits, you cannot become a licensed real estate broker. That's incredibly important considering the amount of money that's flowing in and out of your doors. Take Burt Whalen, for example. His company, Ocean Point, he was the real estate broker there. It is now public record that Burt Whalen has lost his real estate license. If you're working with people who are not actually licensed, you will not know that they have already passed those background checks. That's why this is so very important. 
Now, you can't eliminate all risks, and of course, the first crime anyone commits, prior to that, they had no crimes on their records. But what we can do, guys, is we can play the odds, just like when we're screening our tenants. There is no guarantee that when we place a tenant in our unit, there is no guarantee in the world that we will become their first eviction. But what we can do is increase our odds of success by denying every tenant who has already had an eviction on their record because they are more likely than someone who has no eviction on their record to stop paying their rent again. It's kind of the same thing here uh, <clears throat> with the uh, criminal records. And that brings me to my last point, the last thing that I think you guys need to do to avoid being the victim of a turnkey real estate investment scam. And it's more or less just piggybacking off of having your property manager and the person selling you these properties, you know, only dealing with licensed individuals. And that is make sure you are dealing with licensed attorneys or title companies in regards to your title work. You need to ensure that you are actually purchasing these properties with clear and marketable title. You never, ever, ever, ever want to buy a property from someone who is offering you a quit claim deed. What a quit claim deed is, is them just selling you the property and not actually running a title search and not putting a title insurance policy on that. You see guys, what a title insurance policy is, that means the title company or an attorney, depending on what state you're buying and selling real estate in, they look up the title of that property and they make sure that there are no clouds or encumbrances on the property. What an encumbrance or a cloud could possibly be is, for example, let's say you were to purchase a property for $50,000. If you just got a quit claim deed, someone would just, you know, you'd get the deed and you're now the owner of that $50,000 property. That property is worth $50,000. What if five years from the point that you bought that $50,000 property, you sold it to someone for $50,000, because again, that's what it's worth, and then they ran a title search because they're smarter than you. They know, they must have watched my videos that you need to get clear and marketable title. They ran a title search and it turns out that there is actually a lien on that property for $100,000. Well, now you can't sell your property unless you bring another $50,000 to the table plus the $50,000 you already purchased. So what a title insurance policy is, is a title company or a lender, you know, they're going to go ahead and they're going to run the background to ensure that that property is clear and they are going to insure the clarity of your title. So if five or 10 years from now, say you get a general warranty deed, you got that title insurance, okay? You tried to sell that $50,000 property 10 years down the road. Somebody claimed that there was a $100,000 mortgage on it that they missed during your previous title search. You have a title insurance policy, which means you are not gonna be the person that has to foot the bill for that. It's gonna be the company that insured your title. This is similar to a homeowner's insurance policy, right? You know, if your home burns down and you had homeowner's insurance on it, the insurance company, they're going to foot the bill to rebuild the house. More or less, it's the same thing here. So in summary, folks, we cannot reduce all of our risks, but if you follow these five simple and actionable steps, you can greatly reduce the chance that you're going to become victim in a turnkey real estate investment scam. If you are watching this and you've got stories about bad landlords, we would love to hear them. Go ahead and post a comment in the comment section below. If your story is interesting and compelling, we may want to have you on our show and do an episode of the Landlords from Hell show about your story. Or other landlords out there, if you guys are watching this and you got bad tenants, of course, we also run the Tenants from Hell show. So go ahead and post us a comment about your nightmare tenants, and we can have you on an episode of the Tenants from Hell show and tell your story. As always, I'm James Wise with Holton Wise, and this is Real Estate Investing Made Easy.
Cleveland, Ohio is widely considered to be one of the top rental markets in the entire United States. This is because here in Cleveland, our housing prices are low and our rental prices and demand are high. At Holton Wise, we provide the complete turnkey solution for all real estate investors, whether they are local, out of state, or even abroad. As real estate brokers, we will provide you with agent representation to help you buy properties ranging from single family homes to large apartment complexes. We even have referrals for lenders who can provide investment property loans to investors located in all 50 states, allowing you to capitalize on the use of leverage or other people's money. We have referrals to top-notch title companies so you know that all of your transactions are safe and secure, with every single property being delivered to you with clear title. Once you close on the property, we have an investor-focused insurance brokerage who can handle all your property insurance needs. This insurance brokerage handles auto, home, life, and business policies, but they specialize in working with policies for landlords. We also have full service property management. We can handle all rental property advertisements, tenant placement, rent collection, evictions, maintenance, landscaping, construction, and repairs. In addition, Holton Wise also offers digital media and education. One day, when you are ready to sell your investment, Holton Wise, as the number one seller of investment properties in the greater Cleveland area, can market your property in a video just like this one to our worldwide base of investors who are looking to capitalize on the high cash flow opportunities in the Cleveland, Ohio market. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on our latest content including video tours and analysis of investment properties that are available for sale, real estate investment education, and our most interesting encounters with tenants from hell. Holton Wise, real estate investing made easy.